It's a beautiful world. It's beautiful because of the things in it and the animals in it and the people in it and the ideas that float in the air and in our heads. Sometimes I like to go out in nature, breathing fresh air, not thinking at all. And sometimes I like to be in a space of ideas, just letting them come to me, following them where they go. A good conversation is a great way to make this happen. People bounce ideas off each other and always behind the scene, there is the unseen. You would have noticed that often in my conversations, I'll say something like, I'm just thinking aloud. And when we are thinking aloud, we are alive. I love having conversations like that. Conversations like today's. It's a beautiful world. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is Deepak V.S., a dear friend of mine who I've had such great conversations with in the past that I wonder why it took so long to get him on the show. Deepak is an entrepreneur and he's founded and runs a startup called Tilt, which provides shared bikes for residential campuses. You'll hear more about that idea here, but it's far from the only idea you'll hear about. Deepak is a deep thinker on many subjects and when I chat with him, I feel like my brain has been poked in a hundred different places in a good way and it is now explosively alive, ready to embrace and grok more of the world. In the conversation you'll hear now, we'll share radical thoughts on education, entrepreneurship, morality. We'll talk about an old woman who sits on your chest, on shadows that flit about the room when you lie paralyzed. Entrepreneurs will of course find this episode super useful as Deepak has some great insights. But honestly, the wisdom in this episode goes far beyond that, so enjoy. But before we get started, let's take a quick commercial break. Hey, the music started and this sounds like a commercial, but it isn't. It's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love, a YouTube show I am co-hosting with my good friend, the brilliant Ajay Shah. We've called it Everything is Everything. Every week, we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about, from the profound to the profane, from the exalted to the everyday. We range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world. Please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. The show is called Everything is Everything. Please do check it out. Deepak, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. <laughs> Thank you, Amit. It's very nice to be here. So, you know, we first met at a conference a couple of years back and you were, of course, easy to talk to. Uh, our ideas coincided on many things. But one particular thing I remember is your insistence that I come for a long walk with you around the lake yeah. at the place where we were at some ungodly hour. Uh, right now, it seems to me like it was four in the morning, but it was probably more like six. And then we went on a long walk and sort of had a conversation and you told me about your love of dancing and uh, so on and so forth. So... Tell me your approach towards meeting new people and making friends and all of that. Like how much intentionality is there in that? How much of it is just natural to you in, in, in the sense that it is to some gregarious people that, hey, I'm just friendly with everyone. And how much of it is an effort you put in because you've, you know, seen the benefits that accrue to yourself? Okay, well, the, the question is very good. And the reason it's good is because in 2022, my best friend got married. So I'd known him all my life from childhood and up. And for the longest time, he was my only meaningful close friend. Uh, you become very close with your co-founders. They're also my friends, of course. But inevitably, you have a business relationship as well. And so it's not purely friendship. And I think when that happened, and he since moved to Japan, it forced me to find new friends. Uh, so I don't think I'd contended with this question until until this happened. And then I said, all right, what, what is that process like of finding new friends? So that year, 22, 23, was, was that period of exploration for me. I think it's a few things. So if you remember, I'd like to bring you back to before we went for the walk. So the first time we met actually was Shruti introduced us. And then we got on a bus and we were in the last row of the bus, if you remember. And I said something about uh, antinatalism to, to Mohit. And then you said, have you read Phil Larkin's poem? This be the worst. And I said, yes, I have. And then I started to recite it. So I said, they mess you up, your mom and dad. They do not mean to, but they do. And then you said, no, no, they fuck you up, your mom and dad. They do not mean to, but they do. And at the time, I knew we'd be friends. Because one, you love reading poetry, which I love reading as well. And two, you were not afraid to say the word fuck. 
and you were not afraid to to call it as it was, which is that I was being politically correct um, in reciting a poem because I thought, well, I was in front of people who were much older than me, um, and it would not uh, be the most appropriate to to say something that was offensive. And and maybe it's something in that which is that uh, the, uh, the ability to to form friendships depends on on some level of shared curiosity. So we may not have to agree on the the places we reach, but we have to agree on the fact that we're mutually curious about something. You may have friends who. I don't know, uh, and you seem to have lots of friends who, for example, love music. Right? That's a, a mutually shared curiosity. You may you may not agree on many other things, but that mutual love for curiosity sort of sets you apart. So, in the last two years, perhaps the sorts of friends I've made are people who who I have mutually shared curiosities with. I've also pivoted my definition of what what a friend means. So, I used to think of it as a, an extremely tight and rigid structure, uh, where it meant undying loyalty from today to infinity, which it does mean. But there's also gradients, and people come across the entire the entire spectrum. Um, so it could also mean that you're just a friend that one time a year when they have to call and talk to somebody about something. In which case, I'm happy to be that friend. Um, and then sometimes it means what I said before, which is that undying undying loyalty from today to the end of time. So it's it's a it's an entire gradient. It's perhaps a dilution of the of my original conception of a of a friend. But nonetheless, th- that's approximately the, you know my answer to to what friendship has been for me. Uh, but it's a discovery. For me as well, uh, I'm I'm new to building a large base of friends. I've always had very few, so I'm trying to change that. For those of the listeners who are not aware of Larkin's great poem, I'll just read it out because why not? This be the worst by Philip Larkin. They fuck you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats, so half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can, and don't have any kids yourself. And you know we can come to our joint views on antinatalism later. But I love this phrase: "Man hands on misery to man; it deepens like a coastal shelf." I was about to say exactly that. What an incredible way to write something! Only a poet can do that. Yes, man hands on mis, and it's one of those. So I have the tendency to remember lots of poems; they're just sitting in the back of my head, and I can rattle them off without having to look at the page. Uh, and this is one of those, right? Man hands on misery to man, and the image that it forms, which is it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can, which is the advice that he saw. Wisdomously provides, and don't have any kids yourself. Uh, and of course, we can agree to disagree or or, or uh, discuss antinatalism yeah. in uh, in detail if we'd like to. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't take away from from how how powerfully that poem was written. Yeah, so I think that, that that's what drew me to you for sure, which is that we had a shared love for poetry and literature. But yeah, it could be any topic. That's that's how friends are made. And I sometimes wonder if, and this will sound like a very cynical thought, but I sometimes wonder if. You know, there is a little bit of hypocrisy at the heart of any friendship because I think about how all of us live our lives inside our own heads, right? Everything else is, you know, we are the main character. Everyone else is a character in the play. And I have, and I guess this is true for introverted people, especially that people who live the kind of withdrawn life that I have. That you are in your head much more than you would like. And I realized this much later in years, and I started questioning myself that am I treating people, including people close to me? as something that is instrumental and then it takes an act of will to see them as people in themselves like you know satra has his famous quote about uh, how hell is other people and iris murdock has uh, you know my favorite quote about love where she writes love is the extremely difficult realization that something other than oneself is real right mm. and so the way that i think about friendship is that someone that i'm straight away comfortable with and like but i but that also of course originates from putting oneself at the center of it that i am comfortable with i like i think about like i've had i've had people die on me uh, at of different ages and when i remember i always realize that the memory i'm remembering of them when i feel sad or whatever is a memory of something that happened between us and i am again at the center of it so i i mean i don't know if this is coherent but i was just thinking aloud after what you said that to that that i think that a certain part of accepting this fact is accepting that then you also need to be intentional about your relationships and see other people as other people and not just something that adds a particular kind of meaning or value to your life what are your thoughts i mean i would say that the the reason that you want to be intentional about this is also quite self centered yeah that, yeah so which is perfectly fine I think I think being selfish about your relationships is is the natural way to do it. Anybody who claims otherwise is 
either not being introspective or or dis or is being dishonest. But there's nothing so. In fact, so this is this is the same as a the double thank you moment of a free market or a a, a capitalist interaction, which is let's say you meet a friend and you have a wonderful conversation. So we do this for however long you're going to uh, make me sit here, and at the end of which I shake your hand and I say thank you. That was wonderful, right? Uh, and then you say thank you, Deepak. That was wonderful. Um, and we've we've created more than each of us ind- individually could have in the same amount of time. So we were saying I was saying this earlier to you when we were speaking, but. we are just accidental animals on a little speck of dust on some corner of at least as far as we know right all the empirical evidence points to that and there are no obligations for perfect solutions and there are so many things that we certainly can't control history our psychology the, the things that we philosophically believe our childhoods all of that is completely outside our control and there seems to be tied up in all of that this this deep and instinctive urge to get it outside of yourself through the use of words could be action as well so you may want to i don't know dance or uh, sing or something like that or play play an instrument perhaps uh, but words quite frequently and we're, we're trying to grapple with all these super interesting concepts uh, interesting on on some level but also worrying on another where it keeps us up at night or we're quite concerned about how we resolve you know these abstract topics and i think the only way to do it is to speak to somebody else about it there's only so far you can go in your own head and it it could be something as simple as hey this is what's happening in my house or something as complex as i don't know why i'm here and why all of this exists so even if it does irrespective of degree of of complexity inevitably having that conversation with somebody is the is the process by which uh, you sort of flesh it out i mean i don't know more about this than that i'm sure there's a psychologist somewhere who can explain it better but i feel like the the way to evolve on ideas that you already have or troubles that you're already facing or philosophy that you're already uh, in the process of believing or undergoing is invariably to have it go out there into the world so sound it out and then have somebody else play the role of uh, poking at it uh, asking questions validating right? and you keep coming back to it over and over again that's why we have these relationships of course there are lots of other reasons but we do it selfishly and that's perfectly fine if they're getting a similar uh, end result out of it or well well the the means is the end so if 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 that is as exciting and interesting and valuable to them through the process uh, then what else could you ask for that's that's a great friend to have earlier at breakfast also you pointed out that the, uh, the the means is at the end in a different context and i love how many different things it can kind of apply to you know and of course it leads to all these clichés about journey not destination and etc etc but there are also to what kind of a kid were you were you sort of an introspective kid were you reading a lot what did you want to be what was your view of the world give me a sense of yeah hyper vigilant and this uh, journey not the destination comes straight from my dad so every time we would i think how you do some things is how you do all things and every time we attempt to to get somewhere it's a yeah but once you get there it's it's not really what you think it it's going to be and it's the process of getting that that's that's super fun in fact it's the process of getting there that is the end that is what you have to strive towards uh, because once you get there you you'll genuinely miss the entire flow of of all the things that that ha- happened on your journey to wherever it is that you were going and i'd also contest that we never really get anywhere uh, we're always traveling and then we stop I I grew up in a house where dad used to read lots of books. He used to read books in the toilet like on, on the party which is where I got the habit from. Um, and I know that that that's considered blasphemous in lots of ways, right? Like b- books are sacred and uh, but that seemed to be something that we were we were comfortable looking past in our household because what was in the book seemed to be a lot more valuable than the sanctity of the book itself. Uh, so I started reading very young. I think reading certainly marked a large part of my growing up a lot of it in the early days was uh, just fiction so you know enid blyton goosebumps those were the sort of early years of reading um, and then as i grew sort of harder to read but more complex s- stories and it became apparent very early on that if you learn to communicate well that is you speak well write well and then you're able to understand the intent of what uh, what somebody is attempting to communicate when you read something that's very valuable it's very valuable in a way that it 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 anchors you for the rest of your life and and makes you multidisciplinary the ability to learn by, by reading a book and then the ability to communicate your ideas to people across different fields so each each individual person may may be able to understand a concept differently and the onus is on me to be able to express it in such a way that that person understands it became sort of fundamental to those early years of growing up so i did all those things i read a lot i i wrote a lot i spent a lot of time debating that was part of sort of growing up but 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 broadly words literature poetry language uh, was was key and fundamental to that early stage or early years journey of mine my dad is uh, 
was a government servant, so he started working at the age of 19, 20 in the income tax department, um, and then worked there all his life till his, his early 50s. Uh, then he recently retired. Mum is a school teacher, so she used to teach computer science and computer applications before my brother was born. And then once he was born, she took a break and then came back to teach the earlier years. So she does Montessori. She taught for many years before starting her own school. Um, and then today that's what she does. So we have three branches in Bangalore and she teaches uh, young children. Uh, it's an integrated Montessori, which means some of the children in her class are on the spectrum. They have learning difficulties. Um, and I ended up, at least through observation, learning quite a bit about what that journey looks like. And I think the the interesting thing in watching my household evolve, so my mom was very young when she got married, my dad also was fairly young, they had me fairly young, is how all of us grew as people through the years. So I don't think we'd ever had a startup conversation at the dinner table. We'd have lots of conversations. It was very frequent to have uh, detailed conversations about all sorts of abstract things and uh, we'd vehemently disagree and in a, in a good way in that we're all growing in the same direction. But over the last few years, uh, maybe the last 10, 15 years, those conversations have evolved as the world has changed around us and as uh, topics have changed. We've grown as people individually. And I think that that's sort of an earmark of what my childhood was like as well, which is that you start off somewhere but we're all willing to consistently evolve and adapt and, and grow as people. Yes. I think that was broadly what my childhood was like. I'm happy to answer any other questions you have pertaining to that if you do. Tell me about how you sort of learn to look at the world. Because what typically happens is when you're young, you adopt a frame that seems to fit, you know, the way you look at the world. And for some people, they stop right there. The first set of explanations that explain the world to them is what it is. Some people keep looking and keep looking and it's it's always fluid, obviously, and it never fixes. And I, I, th I think for me, where it got fixed is after wrestling with various different ways of looking at the world, where it got fixed was in terms of the values that I hold dear to myself, uh, like individual freedom and consent and all of those yeah. things and it eventually and it arrived there in a bunch of different ways and then that like kind of clarifies everything so tell me a little bit about you know what shaped the way that you look at the world because it is very different from the default around you and it is also quite different from people in your generation uh, itself right so how did you arrive here i think it's marked by um, an early understanding that authority may not be correct so it was not long before I realized that my teachers, my parents, all of my mentors could possibly be wrong, which is not so easy to come to if you think about your own childhood or most people think about how they grew up. Unless that that degree of skepticism is introduced as as something fundamental to that journey of learning, inevitably you end up thinking that that which my which my ancestors or people around me or whoever it is who, who is uh, giving me um, tuition believes is is likely what is true. And I think for me, it came from a set of conflicting beliefs because I'd hear one person say something and I, and I respected and, and, and trusted their opinion quite a bit. Um, another person say the opposite thing, the mathematical equation, like these Venn diagrams don't intersect. So only what one must be true. At best, it's possible neither are true. And the only way out was to read a book about it or to go. And I spent a lot of time on 4chan and um, just the, the early years of the internet, uh, which I think also was, so I can't believe I missed this out in the, in, the early, uh, in the earlier question about my childhood. But the internet was so fundamental to it because I remember for one of my birthdays, actually, my dad brought home a computer, of course, a shared family computer. And I took to it so quickly. And it was this, you know, 512 KBPS telephone line wala connection. So super slow. But it had the answers. Well, it it had it had potential answers to practically everything, which is if, if I could if I could Google a question, then I'd have 50, 60, 100 different possible solutions to the same question and also nuanced in little ways. And I'd find myself diving deep into random rabbit holes uh, that were not of any practical utility, but I think unlocked that skeptic part of me, which is that it's, it's possible that everybody is saying things that are not possibly true. It's possible we don't know what true means. It's possible people have different definitions of what true is. And so inevitably the, the, the philosophy underlying these, these dispositions that people have uh, came to the forefront. Yeah, so, so I think it came from that, which is a combination of having the internet to, to tell me that, hey, there are other people in other parts of the world who have other beliefs and those beliefs or, or other theories on how the world works, something in particular works, um, which are equally good. And then the second is in my own life being surrounded by people who had different views, uh, which meant that the only legs to stand on were my own. And I had to figure this out uh, by myself. 
What I'm also curious about is how we learn the process of learning. Like one thing that I think we might have spoken about in the past as well is on how much education is broken in the sense that our current education system, if you just look look at schools, it was designed for the industrial revolution. You have kids of the same age studying together, studying the same bunch of subjects, etc., etc. And it's designed in the early 19th century. It's designed to turn out workers for the industrial revolution or babus for the British Empire in India, whatever the case might be. And it is completely irrelevant now. And I guess this is a subject you've thought about, one, because like me, in some ways, you're mostly self-taught through technology, you know, enabling that through the internet and all of that. And second, your mom, of course, has also is an entrepreneur herself in the space where she's doing all of these schools, etc, etc. So you might have been exposed to really early ideas on why education isn't working, and uh, so on and so forth. So what are sort of your thoughts on that? Because I, I've been thinking about it for a few years and it seems to me to be one of the great problems to solve. But it appears also that no one really has a handle on this. All the edtech startups I see are really basically teaching school syllabus or whatever in, uh, you know, uh, are are within that same paradigm. How does one change the paradigm? What should one learn? How does one learn it? How do you, how do you think about all of this? Yeah, so I have two answers to this. The first is a thought experiment which I conducted with a close friend of mine recently. It's called the Grand Swimming Race. All right. So let's say that we replaced the IIT exams with a swimming race. Mm -hmm. India has a, a vast shoreline. So I'm sure you could fit all 10 lakh, 15 lakh applicants along the shores. You were to blow a whistle, 10 kilometers long, you swim the entire distance. The first 10,000 to cross the other end end up getting seats across various IITs, NITs, whatever it is. And I know you asked about early education, but uh, yeah, that's fine. this, yeah, this that's hypothesis, fine. Uh, th this, this thought experiment lingers on the, the later stage. Let's say they all went to these IITs, studied, and then, and then sort of grew on to be engineers, whatever it is that, that they do afterwards. Now, I would, I would contest that you'd have no difference in the quality of engineer you produce, right? Uh, and if you if you had to say Deepak, you're wrong, you'd have to explain why. And the way to explain why is probably to to tell me what the exam tests for in particular. And I don't think anybody has a good coherent answer. Uh, what do our exams or our, what does the testing process test for in particular? It certainly can't be scientific rigor. So if you're and there's various reasons for that. So one one good way to think about it is that take take these exams, the the engineering exams in particular, you. You don't really apply to a computer science degree at an IIT. You, cro you, you pass the exam and then you take up whichever seat you get, which to me sounds something like, let's say, an, an example here is if you think about subjects like metallurgy, which, which are taught in IITs, they're filled with kids who wanted to study computer science engineering, didn't get in and didn't want to lose the IIT or the NIT tag and hence said, you know what, I'll take whatever it is that comes uh, that's second best and they're sitting in these, in these classrooms instead. S somewhere in India, there are there is some collection of, of children who deeply care about metallurgy. They love mm. the subject. They certainly want to study it. They want to be metallurgists all their lives. And the very best metallurgy professors are stuck in IITs and NITs, teaching kids who never want to be there in the first place. So something is broken about, about this, this whole setup in the first place. I don't think we aspire to be engineers, scientists, although, although that's certainly part of that curi curious drive when you start off, right? But along the way, it's, it's corrupted, muddied, dirtied by this, this drive to get the tag, get the degree, so on and so forth. Yeah, so so uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, I think the, the deeper question is what are we testing for? One layer deeper than that perhaps is why are we testing? And I think when, once it started up and we started building a business, uh, we, had, we had to do the arduous task of hiring employees. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves in the position of, of having to ask certain questions that determine whether we hire this person or not. And none of the scores that they had on their, their resumes, the tests that they did conduct, etc., were indicative in any way of their ability to be long-term meaningful assets to whatever journey we are on as a business. Right? It, it could be that, hey, we want you to help us on figuring out the operations of the business. And it's not so easy. It's not a 60-second question, which is another very bizarre part of testing. Nothing in the real world is 60 seconds or you're dead or it doesn't work out or you don't. Uh, in, in fact, my strong preference is for those people who don't give me a 60-second answer, who say, you know what, I'm going to think deeply about the subject and maybe a week or two. The best discoveries that we, we've ever made collectively as humanity have come after years of meditation uh, and never in the short run. Why do we use that as, as a testing mechanism? Yeah, beats me. Um, except for, for that, the practical answers, it's a filter, right? It's, it's an arbitrary filter, as arbitrary as a swimming race, perhaps. 
and when we were hiring i think that's when it stood out most to me that those folks who had the very best uh, resumes the the highest scores etc were very poor long term partners for for these arduous journeys that don't involve certainty and it's a breakage in uh, sop the sop that you're you're given as a child is you go to school top 3 ranks at all times then you you do your 11th grade 12th grade you write the iit exams you get into an iit you top those classes all the way and then you get a great package monetarily and that's you for life right uh, and you idly go off into one of these uh, you know abc right accounting banking any of these these sort of industries so that that's sort of answer number 1 which is i don't know what we're testing for i don't know why the results of these tests are meaningful and if they are you, of course you have a random subset of those people who are also you know uh, great in other ways so they could pass the tests and they could also do other things but th- that's the first way to think about this the second my co-founder daksh dropped out of college in his second year he's been coding since he was 14 years old and i have not met a better developer than daksh and that's because in the first week of meeting him we were talking about you know people who write code developers software engineers and he said a great engineer is not one who knows how to write code well that person should have two additional skill sets one they should know how to communicate and the second they should know how to design and both these skill sets are are so hard to learn in a classroom Uh, if you are talking to a product team and you have you have a disagreement about the color of a button which by the way happens if you talk to enough early stage companies the 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 leading cause of of startup failure is that founders fall apart and founders fall fall apart for silly reasons reasons like we can't agree on what the color of a button should be uh, we've never had those disagreements at tilt and the reason is because i have co-founders like daksh who, who who come into it knowing that to be able to communicate well through the process of building something so this is the right brain right you you you've you've set you set a meaningful goal that meaningful goal is i want to build something of value because it gives me purpose it it fills me with something to do to the entire day such that when i go to bed at night i look back on my day and say i wouldn't have done it differently right so that that's that's my right brain long term purpose that i've sort of placed into the world and i've said that that's where i want to go and then i have to use reason and logic and my left brain all the math in the world and all the writing the code to accomplish that goal right it's it's the emissary in some way and um, and knowing that means that you communicate well you design well because you're designing again knowing that you have a long term goal in place and of course you write code well so he's been coding since he was 14 then came to i think uh, an nit in india to study and then in a second year dropped out and i remember when i was talking to him over the phone and we were not co-founders yet very close to being and i asked him why he was considering dropping out and he said everything they use is outdated the the languages they're teaching me are wrong in fact um, he he failed an exam if i remember correctly because he wrote the code in an updated version of the language wow. that the professor did not know at a, a pioneering institute in the country okay so we know the problem exists right all of this could be replaced with a swimming race um, we just want to produce engineers and so we do but for for those people who care deeply about the task that they're doing this is not a monetary exposition it's not that i want to earn money fill my bank account retire right whatever have a have a car a job you know wife children and die if you don't want to follow that that uh, extremely boring and and preset life then it, your best your best bet is not doing it at all which is the earlier you get out of the system the more time you spend self learning and doing it on the internet reading books meeting people having these conversations and and then figuring stuff along the way a lot of learning is done through doing which is you you have to write the code you have to build the product you have to ship you have to sell you have to actually do it and then make all those mistakes along the way um, and it's quite unfortunate that all of those really intelligent well meaning individuals who've been sucked into the system simply because they've been convinced that the system is the only way it will work and they have to have the degrees and so on and so forth to be able to make it in life um, are only delaying that process they do not avoid it so when you're 25 26 and you finished your masters or your phd or whatever it is and then you leave the system you still walk into a world where you you you're quite unprepared for what it what you really need to be able to succeed in it and in, inevitably that time you have you have to go through the same journey you have to do all of the same things so start early that's my only advice and skip the system i mean we have to ask the deeper question why test it all why have these these complex systems in today's world do you really need to go to college or can you just start pick something that you're super excited about and go do it this is such a fantastic thought experiment like i'm i'm so glad we're having this conversation if nothing else comes out of the next 9 hours right we talk just this sort of experiment alone <laughs> is and for me no no and i i actually think that it's a serious thought experiment and i kind of agree with you because what you would test for with the swimming race is really temperament and hunger and to me though those things really matter like you would no doubt have heard of this famous uh, iconic study by claudia muller and carol dweck where uh, the title of the study is praise for intelligence can undermine children's 
motivation and performance. And I'll tell you why this is relevant. I'll describe the study briefly. What they basically did was they split kids into two groups and they were given tasks and one group was praised in terms of attributes like adjectives you are intelligent you are smart you are this you are that and the other group was praised in terms of efforts and, and thereby verbs you tried hard you stuck to it you know etc mm. etc et and what they found over subsequent tests is that the cohort which was praised for its attributes you're so intelligent or whatever would try less hard and would feel entitled because hey they've internalized that they are intelligent and would even cheat if they had to whereas the cohort that was praised for their attributes would just keep trying hard because that's what they were praised for and they would inevitably get ahead and when you mention that the people with the best resumes were the people who were least suited to what, what you were hiring for this instantly struck me that actually it's not a coincidence I would expect an inverse correlation because someone who's been through that filtering system and would automatically have the self-image that I I am brilliant, I am this, along with all the attitude problems that that would bring. Right. And uh, they would, uh, you know, they would have learned at a slower rate, whereas others outside the system would have tried harder. Like, I remember for Everything is Everything, at one point when we were looking for a new crew, Ajay and I interviewed uh, this girl called Namsita, who is 19 now and who uh, works with us. And uh, there was a moment where she said that she dropped out of school and taught herself filmmaking. Mm. And Ajay and I looked at each other and we knew. There's no reason to even communicate beyond that. You just know that this person is right because they've got a great attitude, they've got the hunger, they're positive and so on and so forth. And therefore, the education system therefore is fundamentally wrong. Like as Karthik Mullitharan said in a memorable ed episode we did on education, that our education system is meant for sorting and not for educating. But here it would seem that even the sorting is based on the wrong attributes. And that the sorting can be done uh, sort of differently. How would the, like you, you mentioned how you sort of designed your approach in the company differently to get the right people. How would you design the education system uh, differently? I mean, the swimming thought experiment indicates that it's completely broken as it is because swimming would actually, uh, I agree with you, it would in fact get you better students. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here I'll push back. And the reason is, of course, swimming would get you better students. If, if all you had to do was swim. But now you'd have all of these new layers pop up, right? So every every institute in Kota would replace their classrooms with very large swimming pools. Mm -hmm. Every, I don't know, professor who sits on a billboard uh, because they teach physics or chemistry really well will get replaced by a swimming instructor in his speedos who will be standing there saying that I can get you there in 15 seconds, 20 seconds faster. Uh, and you'd start hacking the process which is what happens with the IIT exams or any exam actually, the, any competitive exam. And I did this. I did this for about a year. Uh, we, I prepared for the, for the examination myself. Uh, you spend a lot of time learning how to eliminate certain questions that could, be pos that, that could possibly be wrong, uh, how to skip questions that don't make a lot of sense. So you end up hacking the process. Uh, this is the unseen behind the scene. And it is, it is uh, true that many of the, the people who end up, you know, passing these exams, um, are using these loopholes to get there. So you're certainly missing out on those on those wonderful, genuine, amazing scientists, amazing engineers, amazing managers, whatever it is that, that these folks want to do. I'm saying sk skip the testing. This is not, I mean, if, uh, and there are very many ways to learn. I know that some subjects need a classroom. Like, so I, I don't know if we've ever spoken about this, but I've always wanted to learn physics. Um, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. All, all my early childhood, from from when I was a child up until like 10th, 11th grade, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. And that's a, an example of a subject that's certainly learned in a classroom. You need some equipment, you need a, a good professor, so on and so forth. So seek them out, because these are not people who are unwilling to teach. And we know this. And it's, it's something that, it's so silly, you know, when I look back in retrospect, it seems so obvious. But as a young person, it doesn't stand out to you. You always feel like, oh, you know what? Amit is so is such an extraordinary podcaster that if I if I wrote an email to him saying, Amit, will you teach me how to podcast or start my own podcast? He wouldn't even respond, right? He, he which is not true. I mean, you certainly would. You'd be so excited about the fact that someone wrote to you saying, "Hey, I want to start a podcast," and you have so much knowledge about this particular domain that you're waiting to give away uh, because it's so useless otherwise. Right? Most people in your life don't want to learn about how you organize your podcasting. Um, that you you explicitly do a one and a half hour call or meet him or her for coffee just to tell them about the art of podcasting. So seek them out. I, I don't see why, why. Why do we have to do three, four years of, of these additional steps, right? Intern for them, uh, you know, do free work, which is go to them and say, hey, listen, I, I will tail you for the next, you know, two years. I'm willing to do that. Um, and I learned this, I think, in, in two, three different ways. So when we first started up, 
my my first our first step out of university was an incubator based in nasik it's not i don't think it functions today but it was a tata group based incubator and a gentleman there mr hasid kaji who was then the uh, he led special innovations for tcs and then became the cdio for tata power so an extremely intelligent gentleman uh, he said um, so he'd come to our university to to do some you know presentation on something and talk about the incubator and we ended up connecting with him and i remember the the degree of of uncertain of uncertainty in whether we were worth being one of the the folks that the tata group gave money to it, which in hindsight is so silly because of course we were we were willing to work whatever 18 24 hours a day if it if that's what it took travel anywhere do anything we cared so deeply about doing something with our lives that wasn't just sitting in a classroom that we were willing to go uh, uh, in above and beyond most people our age and he saw that but we didn't see it ourselves and i also think about how today if some if somebody who's 19 wrote to me saying deepak i want to build so and so would you be interested in give me an hour i'd say of course of course i'm willing to help you out and i think that that slowly became clear over time and by the time i we sort of met shruti and mohit and these people who have in the last uh, few years been so pivotal to our journey we've become a lot more willing to make the ask which is to say to write the email to send the message knowing that they'd be sort of well meaning and responding um so i think skip the skip the institution entirely don't waste time on you play stupid games you win stupid prizes that's my second favorite quote i, I refer to it quite frequently in my head don't even play the game is is sort of my position um, let them do what they do because the bureaucracy will will come up with new and more innovative ways to trouble you and make it harder for you and all of that and you're right that the end goal is still to produce an employee it is to produce somebody who you know it's just a pair of hands or it's just typing into a keyboard and those jobs are um, are unlikely to to be valuable in the long run they will always be the first to be disrupted you have to learn how to be genuinely curious and creative and adaptive and all of those things are not things that you can learn so easily in a classroom you can learn with mentors etc so do it that way what's your favorite quote uh, you said i was a second favorite <laughs> quote uh, my favorite quote is uh, from tim minchin who you've not met yet yeah. um, i don't i don't think it's his quote directly but there is a song that he wrote based on the quote um, if you open your mind too much your brain will fall out <laughs> uh, fabulous so and i'm just thinking aloud here and i'm thinking that number one i think the key skill in the times to come is the ability to learn something new right now if i want to learn a specific skill like how do i learn writing one thing that is not negotiable is i have to write a lot right how do i learn say playing the guitar one thing that is not negotiable is that i have to play a lot similarly i would imagine that if learning is to be the key skill then one thing i have to do is learn a lot and i think about then the mechanisms of how people learn and you spoke about leaving institutions behind my dear friend gaurav chintamani who edits a show and is a great musician his son is being homeschooled right now uh, because he found the school inadequate and um, and uh, something that uh, uh, you know i found fascinating about his son ishan is that he learned to read through spotify lyrics hmm. this blows my mind he is just listening to songs for the joy of it right. and spotify happens to have the lyrics and through that correlation of what he is hearing and the lyrics on the screen he learns to read and th- this is not a use case that anybody would ever have considered for spotify lyrics but there you are and i'm thinking there are so many ways to learn about the world now it so happens that you know in gorov's case or in the case of natasha badwar who did a truly memorable episode with me episode 301 uh, she also homeschools her kids but they are privileged parents who know what they are doing who've put a lot of thought into it most parents can't i mean school is really it's not for education it's a daycare center so uh, you know is, is there even the glimmer of an alternative model obviously these existing institutions don't work and like you said if you tweak the existing institutions whatever the tweak is will obviously be gamed immediately so you are right you will have swimming classes in kota yeah. if you make that the thing but how but like when you look at your journey of learning is there something in that that is that you feel is typical to the human experience of how we learn something right like when i and people have different approaches right for example learning the guitar right i'm going to start doing that now mm-hmm. and my approach towards learning anything is you go to first principles you understand the theory and yep. then you do the basic hard work so you'll find me practicing scales and doing all of that and doing the basics but for a lot of other people the advice that is given is that you learn a few chords you learn to play songs that will give you the gratification you need and then you can go deeper and that is also a way of learning so is this how have you learned everything that you have learned mm 
there's a presumption baked in that question, which is that I've learned a lot, <laughs> um, which I would disagree with quite vehemently. You um, learned a few things. Fair enough. And Gautam, as you are editing this episode, Gaurav, uh, Gaurav. Gaurav sorry. Um, yeah, p- please be mindful that that this is my first podcast. So this is an example of me learning, for example. And I'm invariably quite nervous, right? So as I step into this room with you and I'm chatting with you, I'm quite nervous about about the fact that this is going to be public. And I'm not so nervous about the fact that strangers are going to listen to this. That's fine by me. Uh, it's that the people I love and care about will be listening to this, right? My friends, my family. What would they say about the things that I'm saying, right? So, okay. So we'll use this as the example. You start off with, with quite a bit of apprehension about whether you're able to do it at all. Uh, can I ever play the guitar, right? I read, I read blog post, which is um, how do you get to the top 20% or something, which is, uh, and, and I thought it was fairly smart, actually. The first year of meaningful practice, a few hours a week, means you're in the top half of whatever subset of, of people you're in, because most people quit in that first year. Um, the second year of practice, the top half of that. By the third or fourth year of practice, the top half of that, which is the top 20%, right, top 25% of, of whatever f- f- field you're aiming to be in. Um, so sure, I mean, uh, practice is a way to go about it. But for me, um, and this is what I'm, I'm doing, or I did as a way to think about learning how to be on a podcast, to podcast itself. Imagine you're in school and you're in fourth grade. You've just learned algebra. Such a such an such a weird concept, right? You have a you have a letter amidst all the numbers, like x plus something. Um, it's and it's so confusing at the outset. You view it on the on the blackboard and it makes no sense to you. Your brain doesn't compute why things work like this. But you know two things. One, you know that others have figured it out. There, there's, a, there's a great many number of children in fifth, sixth, seventh grade all above you who've all figured out that that this thing makes sense. It's part of the curriculum, which means it should make sense in some way. Um, so you have comfort in that. And second, you know somewhere deep down that you will figure it out because you've made it from first grade to second to third to fourth, which means invariably you'll make it to fifth. So it's only a matter of time before you get there. Now think about if you were in fifth grade already, right? And some fourth grade kid walked up to you and said, hey, there's my teacher sort of putting, you know, <laughs> alphabets in, in numbers. Can you please explain to me what the hell is happening? You could, right? You would be able to because you've just finished your algebra course, you've passed all the exams, you would be able to. So I think the the way to approach learning is to third person yourself. To say, look, th- um, and this is also the answer to lots of moral questions. I was talking to Mohit Satyendra about this, where the Stoics would frequently recommend doing this, where they'd say, imagine a future version of yourself standing beside yourself when you're about to make a very hard moral decision. What would they say to you? And how would they advise that you go about this, right? And it's, it's what I would recommend in this case as well. Make the presumption that you're certainly going to figure it out. You have figured out everything else so far. Enough people have figured it out that you know that it's not just the top 1% of IQ that, that sort of gets you there. Uh, and lots of things are not a function of IQ, it's just a function of practice. And then how, how, would, how would a future version of yourself who knows that subject advise you on how to navigate this, this learning field ahead of you? And perhaps they wouldn't say take the short-term route. They wouldn't say memorize or they wouldn't say just learn a few chords uh, to go back to your example. Um, they'd, probably, they'd probably start off by explaining the first principles really well. If I think about how I teach somebody something, I have a little brother and he often comes to me with some questions or the other. My attempt to teach starts off with some first principles where I say, look, here are some things that we know are true. Of course, you can question them. But for the sake of this learning experience, let's pretend like those are true. So then remember those. And then now we'll try and build on top of this, right? Um, so... I know I employ this frequently, which is I other myself. There's a there's a third third person Deepak, who's from the future, who's already done the thing that I want to do, and then I would ask of that Deepak uh, what advice he has for me. Uh, I don't do this really. I don't you won't find myself in a room talking to the air, uh, but in my head, this is sort of the thought, thought experiment that takes place. I recently learned how to drive very late in life because I lived all over the country, didn't have access to a car, and I remember before I learned to drive. I would have dreams where I would have to drive for something, you know, like a parent would have an emergency or I'd have some meeting to get to and there's no other way to get there. Right? There's, there's some uh, band or something, right? Of course, my brain will, will figure out some some collection of parameters that makes it so that I have to drive. And I do drive. It's not that I don't because theoretically I knew how to drive. But I'm, I'm ramming into everything along the way and scratching every car and a bunch of ped- pedestrians die. Um, but, I, but I get to wherever I have to get to. And I know that that filled me with a certain sense of apprehension um, around driving itself. And when I sat behind the wheel of, of the car for the first time to learn how to drive, I did exactly this, which is, I said, look, everybody around me drives. Right? It's millions of people. There are some people who I would con- consider squarely idiotic who drive really well. So this is not, not something that I should not be able to do. There is a future version of Deepak who has learned how to drive. 
what would he say um, and then that, that took me to youtube videos to figure out how a clutch works you know how the engine works itself just the internals of a car and i studied engineering so i had some basic understanding of it and then me proactively using all those those first principles as i learned to drive um, and it was not long like a few sessions before i was able to drive drive uh, fluently well um, so this is an example of a model that i use i don't know if it's useful to your gentle listeners but yeah uh, this this is this is about the process that i'd like to follow especially for tasks that i know others have accomplished it's incredibly uh, useful i you know in my writing course i invoke the future self in a different way where i talk about you know building habits and i talk about how everything you do shapes your future self if you play and uh, if you spend an hour playing candy crush your future self will be stupider and uh, while if you spend that hour reading or writing or even just relaxing and unwinding uh, your future self will be better off so every action impacts your future self and we don't really think about it but i had never sort of done this twist of a future self coming back and talking to you give me another concrete example of how you know at some point in time you were stuck in the future self sort of the, the this framework M- helped you moral questions in building a business it's it's quite easy to build an immoral business um, especially in india Uh, when i say immoral business i mean the business is immoral i mean you you will follow immoral means to get to whatever end a revenue goal a number of users goal whatever it's it's super easy um, it's easy to bribe it's easy to lie it's easy to to do all the things that you shouldn't sh- shouldn't in quotes uh, do to progress the business and i think at each of those junctures i have two great friends the first is my future self who i consult and i say look and and uh, invariably the advice is always don't take the shortcut It's okay. It's okay if if you spend a year languishing in whatever place you are in, but but don't take this shortcut. Um, th- and I I feel this is like a like a metaphysical archetype of sorts, right? So you could say future self, but you could also say something like um, my purest self, right? The person behind your face, right? Mm. When when all the fog has been has been removed, um, there is a person behind your face, and that person is saying something, and that something comes from a deep intuition. consequence of so- social upbringing and um, the the things that you've identified as first principles so you could question all of that but but undoubtedly there is a man behind your face and what he says is quite important some people are able to to clear the fog through meditation for example some people are able to clear the fog through through deep introspection whatever uh, but it's the same as the future self right or i would i would even go so far as to leap and say that it is the same as god uh, a, a lot of the ways we use god uh, in our personal lives uh, like if you, let's say some, somebody kneels down and prays and they, they're talking about something that's that's deeply problematic in their lives effectively what they're doing is invoking this this man behind their face and they're saying that that, that there seems to be a lot of a lot, a lot of mist and fog between me and the answer and how do i navigate its clearing let's say right as an example yeah so in in the business world it's very easy easy to to get lost but there are there are there are two other I mean, there's another friend i have which is the people around me i remember calling mohit about a very complicated situation i thought it was complicated but it's very simple in fact where we had the opportunity to well it wasn't really a bribe but it was it was just mildly unethical right this is some sort of an equity transaction that involved a little bit of quid pro quo and the way it had been presented to me rationally right sounded completely reasonable this happens what the industry is like you should go ahead and take it and i felt very uncomfortable with it and the first people i go to always with issues like this are my co-founders i i say that the two of them are the wind above my wings <laughs> because uh, they do quite a bit to temper and we do it for each other right we do quite a bit to temper each other uh, which is how lucky i am to have co-founders like that and we wrestled with it internally for a bit but we're really unable to 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 come to the conclusion that we shouldn't do it and i think the reason was because the financial upside was so apparent it was so easy to make a lot of money and make a lot of progress uh, nobody would ever know that that we did something like this even if they did they'd probably say hey, it's perfectly fine everybody does it there's a way to rationalize away these things and i remember calling mohit mohit is investor number 1 yeah for context and he has the highest incentive in my financial growth or the company's financial growth right but when i called him he said deepak so i explained it to him and he said uh, well of course you can't do it it isn't an option and i'd never thought of it that way which is you can only do those things which are options on the table if it's not an option then you certainly can't do it and so if it goes against against uh, what the man behind your face what the person you other the, your, your future version of yourself how it is that you want to personify this 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 feeling of a moral compass uh, then it's not even an option 
right? Uh, so anyway, th- that's another example. But I think through the course of building a company, and I'm sure it's true for you as well, through the course of building a podcast, uh, there will be certain moral quandaries that come up. And usually invoking a future self is a great way to figure out if it's right or wrong. I've never thought about it explicitly. In the past, I have sort of uh, very early on, I refused advertising because uh, I wasn't comfortable with who the advertisers were. In one case, it was a PSB which said that we'll advertise a show, but you have to clear your guest list with us. And of course, I said no. And at another point in time, it was an Ayurveda company. And I, I was like, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. And... And while you were speaking, I, I, I sort of remembered, uh, you know, what Jeff Bezos said in um, his uh, recent episode with Lex Friedman. And that's when I got introduced to the concept of uh, one-way doors and two-way doors, right? Where a one-way door is that, where a two-way door is a decision where, you know, you take a decision, you can easily reverse it. You can walk out of the same door. But a one-way door is once you've taken the decision, you've taken it. There's no walking back. And I would imagine in the kind of decision that you took, obviously, it is a one-way door in the basic sense of once you've taken the investment, you're stuck with it. Yes, But I think it is also a one-way door in a moral sense that once you have compromised this little bit, why won't you compromise more? And there is a part dependence there. And I think it is important to kind of define your limits in that way. And obviously one can change and one can walk it back and one can say, okay, I did that in the past. It was wrong. I won't do it again. But at the same time, I think it's a great advantage to start with a sense of clarity about, you know, who you are and to understand what is a one-way door and what is a a two-way door in this sense. And I guess that was a one-way door in a sense. Yeah, it certainly was. But I don't think you start with a lot of good first principles. It's very hard. Some people do. I suspect if you were to start a new company today, you'd probably have a very solid set of first principles. But we started off fairly young, late teens, right? And it, I mean, so I didn't know what a private limited company was. We don't, I mean, my parents don't have a business background. Like I said at the start, it's not like we were discussing business at the table day in and day out. Uh, in fact, we'd started up and then my dad said, you know, I have a chartered accountant friend of mine. You should talk to him. And I said, what is a chartered accountant? Uh, and then he said, you know what, the state does this and they regulate. And so you have to have CAs who, who sort of sign off on things. And um, his name was Mohan Uncle. And I spoke to Mohan Uncle and he introduced me to the concept of a private limited company. And it blew my mind that you could, that, that limited, of course, being the, the limitation of liability, uh, that you could divide a company up into little shares and that each of those shares could be sold to people for real money, real, again, in air quotes, and that they could make a return on their investment and that there were people doing this for a living. It was never introduced to me as a concept through school, through through you know college even. And it, it, was, it was so wonderful as, a, as an original idea. So if you don't already have strong first principles and you are, you are going through life and discovering them at the same time. And I hope that happens for the, for the, for the rest of my life, that I'm always, you know, revisiting and rediscovering these first principles. Then I think you have to negotiate with them at every juncture of a decision. So you have to come back to it and say, does this still make sense? And are there any new considerations that I now have that, that amend these? Along the way, you try and read as much as you can. So you're, you're still always grappling with whether they make sense or not. And some are soft, some are harder. And these first principles extend across the width and breadth of, of types of domain. So it could be to do with business building. There are some things I certainly won't do. Could be to do with family, with the state, with friends. Um, could be in your personal life, in public life, right? So you have so many first principles to contend with. So I think, yeah, every time uh, two roads appear in the yellow wood, uh, you must stand and think about, and sort of redo the entire thought experiment and consult again the man behind your face. Uh, at least that's the process that the three of us as founders tend to follow. Ajay Shah and I have a wonderful episode of Everything is Everything called The Beauty of Finance, where we talk about the evolution of companies, including the joint stock company and the private limited company and et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it is miraculous. And, and we are so fortunate to be the beneficiaries of innovation that took centuries, but kind of brought us here. Let's go back to your formative years. I'm curious to know, you know, what was your sense of yourself while you were growing up? Like, what were you studying? Where did you go to uh, school? And what was your sense of who do I want to be? Like, in the sense that, did you always have a sense that you would be an entrepreneur? Did you have a sense that you would do things in the field of knowledge? Take me through the paths that got you to your startup to begin with. When... So I, I went to school in, at uh, Clarence. Clarence High School is a school in Richardstown, not too far from here. So I grew up in Bangalore. And I think through school, 
I mean, I'd like to say I spent a lot of time debating, but I'm sure that's a consequence of of some personality type that that I have a a proclivity to to exhibit, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is to be skeptical about everything. I'm very happy to take the contrarian position on any subject, anything at all. I, I mean, sometimes it, it it irritates friends around me, and I'm sure that they're they're kind enough not to say it that way, because whatever they say, I will take the opposite position and then be happy to spend half an hour uh, attempting to defend that position. Um, and i think that came from this which is hey if, if if everybody around me seems to not agree on how the world works then i really have to figure this stuff out for myself which means nothing is off the table uh, so everything has to be sort of uh, argued for and then of course that 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 presented in in debating the difficult thing about about taking that sort of a path is that y- you don't really have an end place in mind yeah so i think that was that was a, a parallel difficult thing for me to figure out which is what do i want to do with with how many of years that i'm on this accidental planet and the the way i i'm able to f- so to so formulate it now in hindsight is i, I fell in love with problem solving uh, the w- the way to avoid intense nihilism in the long term is to have enough meaningful problems to solve in the short term i know that the word meaningful is in air quotes right eventually it's all going to shit the the heat death of the universe will take us all with it but it does not mean that it does not mean that it's not worth pursuing in some way in the immediate it could be a, a challenge that is as small as a as a game of chess which i know you love playing um and maybe that's a good way to to think about this as an example which is when you sit at the chess table there are some rules right so you can't break them these are the rules imposed upon yourself imposed by the person behind your face but those rules mean that a, that a bishop can only move diagonally right so there are some rules to to how you've decided to play this game and then you have a great opponent the opponent can be yourself of course but can also be a competitive space an actual person on the other side of the table whatever it is and through the hour that you spend playing chess or whichever it, whatever game you choose that is so truly and deeply engrossing uh, i don't know about you but i've never walked away from a chess game that i've lost saying damn it i shouldn't have played hmm. i always walk away saying wow what a game uh, i have such a deep appreciation for my for my opponent and appreciation for how there were ideas on the on the chess board that i didn't see and then for how much i still have to learn about the space uh, which means what which means i go to bed at night and i feel quite content and happy with how the day went it doesn't matter whether I, whether i won or lost that particular game the means is the end it is it is the journey itself that was so so interesting and so consuming for my being and that's a very personal choice because the sort of journey that's consuming for your being um is some combination of how you grew up and the first principles that you have your skill sets right what your ambitions are so on and so forth so it doesn't matter pick one um, but but broadly i think that's what i defaulted to which is i said okay you, I, i'm not able to resolve long term purpose long term like these big broad questions that you know for the last 15000 years have been debated among every civilization every society will certainly plague me as well but we should take on short meaningful short meaningful goals um, and journeys and and arcs to pursue so that presented in various ways uh, i love to dance through school which which i particularly like because it's not verbal as much as i love literature and words there are some things i certainly cannot express with with what comes out of uh, my throat and dancing is one of those things i can give an example when the transit of venus happened uh, which is in 2013 or 12 i worked with with dr ajay saxena who um, who's an astrophysicist at the indian institute of astrophysics and and we built a small telescope and then had the whole school observe the transit of venus from my school as as venus passed between the sun uh, 11th grade so 16 17 and i mean it's it's so meaningless in the long arc of things right it's it's just one rock moving between two rocks and some light that we're able and not even the absence of light right because you you cannot see the planet and hence you can see it but it it engaged my left brain immediately which is i sent i set a flag somewhere i said hey here's here's a great and fun thing to follow here's a puzzle and then the the rational side of me with all the math uh, kicked into work immediately which is okay how do we build the telescope you know how should it be set up at what time of the day what if there are clouds and when i went to bed that night i was quite fulfilled i was quite happy with with how that day had panned out i'd set a goal and even if i'd fail even if we didn't watch the transit of venus i'd i'd felt quite quite happy in that we'd attempted in such a meaningful way to try and solve this quote unquote problem so so i think that 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 has become the philosophy for me now which is the the only way to to, to build purpose and meaning is to pick nice fun puzzles uh, of some sort or the other and then throw yourself into it and have a ball doing it 
you know you mentioned chess and while uh, chess as a game is fairly simple in the sense that you have perfect information and it doesn't mirror the complexities of the real world but i'm struck by something the great chess player levon uh, levon aronian once said in a sort of a post game interview where he referred to the game that he had been playing with a fellow top player as a conversation and i love that because in the fact that in his mind it, it, these are not just pieces moving these are an attempt to get at the truth and you're having a conversation with the other player where you say something and the other person says something and eventually you get somewhere and there is sort of a beauty to that endeavor which lifts it above something merely competitive and earlier in this episode you said how you do some things is how you do all things reminiscent of uh, you know the great quote by annie dillard which i love so much uh, how you, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives and it strikes me that that then uh, you know how you built that telescope is how you are building your company is how you will build the build your life is how you will tackle bigger problems down the line perhaps so tell me about some of the problems that intrigued you like i'm intrigued of course by how you got to the specific problem that you're solving with tilt yeah. but what are the other sort of problems that the small problems that you were solving on the way and the big problems that you might have realized will take a lifetime anyway i'm not going to solve this so tell me about your landscape of problems right on that last point i haven't given up hope that i will solve them maybe maybe i figure out something that that uh, billions haven't. of other humans have not um, like the just that it's life. unlikely yeah and also that 42 which by the way was the name of my college club so we started a college okay. club in college called 42 labs anyway but uh, just that that uh, i have concluded that it's not worth spending the entire day the entire week the entire year thinking about those problems those are parallel problems um and lots of things that happen in the real world and through the process of living end up adding uh, to those to that plate right and my ability to think about it uh, could you repeat your question your problem landscape what are the kind right. of problems you solved that's and how did you eventually arrive at so I, i i mentioned that i wanted to be an astrophysicist growing up and that's because i thought that the problem that i had to go after was why the fuck all these things were there there is this this incredibly large universe which as far as we know is some nearly 14 billion years old and on the outer wing of some outermost galaxy on little speck we exist Uh, and i and i loved reading the the carl sagans the stephen hawkings um and and their entirely objective way to approach analyzing the world right so that, that was me growing up i felt a lot of comfort in 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 those sorts of models so initially i thought i'd spend my entire life solving those problems which is if i could do something as as meaningful as figuring out that a black hole exists even on paper uh, which is or the higgs boson particle right Th- these are all incredible leaps to to science and mankind um, so so i think those are the problems that initially gripped me and the reason they gripped me was it, i i cannot perhaps i'm not describing it well enough but the the revelation that nobody knows was something that came to me rather late i think it was like 12 13 when i think it dawned on me that th- there are so many unknowns uh, until then as a child you're cocooned in, in in a world where you think everybody knows everything you ask a question you get an answer and you you take comfort in, in that the answer is right and to have that flipped on its head nobody knows anything and everything could be wrong and th- there's so many things that that we've been entirely unable to explain that we explain through through, through some of the mechanisms was super interesting to me i think the way to look at a problem is the why combinator slogan it is to see if people want it right that is the definition of problem it could be just me it could be some subset of people around me it could be all of humanity but a, a problem is that which people want solved i think it's it's a default in my brain on in, in how in any circumstance if somebody is struggling with something um, and i receive a cr- lot of criticism for this uh, i will default to saying hey so here's how you solve this so here's a potential solution or why don't you build an app or have you tried talking to this person right that is um, it just seems to be th- be the way that i've wired that i'm wired and i think the wiring took place upon the recognition that there are lots of unanswered questions um, i i don't think that i have a particular affinity for a type of problem it could be anything at all um, so, uh, some things i understand better than others uh, some things I, i just don't get as deeply but if it's a if it's a problem that's interesting then um, um, i'm willing to dive dive deep in that like an example is 
we were talking about this earlier right um s- s- someone asked me about why there are no such things as, as pro suicide helplines now i'm not saying that i want pro suicide helplines right but if if you want to spend half an hour talking about it i think it's a great discussion because that part of my brain sort of turns on and and how do we problem solve for this is there really a problem is there a market of people who want to know why they should commit suicide and if they should then how do we structure this right what are the, le- the legal challenges what does the law say um, and then you dive into like a 2 3 4 day fun run on trying to to solve a problem um I, i i don't suspect it will get many calls but if it did then it's an it's an interesting problem to solve another friend proposed an alternative legal system which is today the way it works is you hire the most competent lawyer you can and i hire the most competent lawyer i can and then we litigate we could do the opposite i could hire your lawyer and you could hire mine i will seek out the least competent lawyer possible <laughs> and you could seek out the least competent lawyer possible for me and it's still an equal battle these are both equally competent or incompetent lawyers and could this be an, an equally well working legal system was the question i'm happy to spend like an hour two hours just digging through this this bizarre idea and whether it makes sense or not and i think this has been me for for everything some of these are, are practical problems that really need to be solved meaningfully um, in which case i love getting my hands dirty a, a school mate of mine told me as i was growing up that i'd make a, a terrible astrophysicist because i can't put my hands on the sun i i can't i can't really touch and feel the the problem that i'm solving and i agree with that i think i i do well when a problem is in the real world and i can go out and stand there and look at it and touch it and feel it and solve it so okay some proclivities that i have a problem solving but in general if people want it then i'm interested in in exploring how it can be solved at at one level i love that you know the the quote from yc about give people what they want you know so one way of looking at the world but i think it was henry ford who had this old quote about if i ask people what they wanted they would say faster horses right so at some point you have to kind of go beyond that and think not just about what people might want in this particular moment which a market survey would tell you but imagine the future in a sense like something rohini nilakani in her episode with me or maybe outside the episode said about her husband nandan is that he has the ability to sit in the future 20 years from now and then look back at the 20 years that have gone by i think at least that is what she said it has been said about him i forget exactly by whom now and how much of in a rapidly changing world you know it seems that these two also bleed into one another that as much as there is a demand for faster horses the idea of the automobile is more than a you know a mere glimmer it is kind in these times where things are happening at the speed they are so how did you arrive at your idea for your startup because it is not an obviously intuitive idea it isn't an obvious gap in the marketplace as it were right. you think people ought to be doing this but if you were to ask them they would not even think of it yeah now you drop into the gradient because it's not like it's it's not that people don't want faster horses in the absence of cars they certainly do so the entrepreneur who started a faster horse company would probably have sold a whole bunch of horses before before they were overtaken taken by ford which just made the best faster horse a horse that that doesn't eat and is significantly faster and so on and so forth so we're in the gradient of um if 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 i have to be able to solve a problem meaningfully well then what is the best way to impact that and that's an innovation question so the market gap is clear people want to move faster it's the innovation question on how we deliver that the story with tilt is we started up in university and the idea came out of my friend and myself buying a bicycle together and the reason we bought a bicycle is the same as every student across every indian college campus the campus is very large there's no way to get from point a to point b and a cycle is the easiest way to solve that problem you typically buy either a share you, you share a bicycle firstly because some of you have classes in the morning some class in the evening and in- invariably you can just share it so why would you spend all the money on, on owning one and you buy it second hand from a senior somebody who's passing out because they use the bike and the next morning as i rode to class the question that popped into my head was why not have a shared bike fleet for the entire campus this is engineering brain right i know i can build it it's possible to engineer a, the thing that locks and unlocks a bicycle um and i know that students want it because i was a student and i wanted it so why don't we build it uh, that's sort of where the idea took shape um we we convinced the university to give us some money that started a college club that turned into a small company and we deployed the first version inside the university campus and so many things went wrong my assumption that we could build the tech turned out to be um, too simplistic it's actually quite hard to build the tech that locks and unlocks a bicycle remotely with a sim card across servers all of those things are quite complex and so immediately the tech started failing people were using the bikes in ways we didn't think they would use it in so an example is let's say you put 10 bicycles at a university hostel entrance 10 students come and pick up those 10 bikes and go to class the 11th student does not have a bike in which case what you would do is hire a truck 
and a truck driver, which is not part of my original plan, to now redistribute the bikes from the destination back to the origin, right? So demand and supply matching. In which case, the obvious question that presents itself, why not put the students in the truck? The truck is going back and forth anyway, which is the shuttle bus which already existed on campus. And it's such a hard realization to come to that the thing that you've spent six months then working on is not really that meaningful a solution because the asset needs to be redistributed at a frequency that you, you had not previously uh, taken into account. And at the same time, I we, we got in touch with the Tata Group, like I mentioned, and they were running a, an incubation program. They had lots of large campuses. So my first paying customers were Tata Motors, TCS, Tata Steel. It's a huge campus spaces. And the problem was fairly similar, which is you have lots of blue-collar staff who have to travel from point A to point B, are not allowed to bring their own private vehicles in. These are staff who already cycle to work. So if you go to the Tata Steel campus in Jumshedpur, you will see the outer walls lined with bicycles the entire way through, right? We ended up deploying in Jubilee Park in Jumshedpur, but it's sort of similar across all campus types, whether uh, uh, Tata Motors or TCS, so on and so forth. And uh, they, they were willing to use a bicycle to do those short mile commutes. So we pivoted the business. And this is what I mean. I'm happy to make something people want. When I spoke to the Tata Group folks and they said, look, this is an, a, a need that we have. I'd made an assumption the first time around, which is that students want this. Clearly, they didn't want it as much as you know we assumed that they would. But here was a customer telling me, look, if you're willing to give it to me, I'm willing to pay you for it. And we had the tech ready. So we pivoted. That was our first pivot. And we moved to the manufacturing side. And we had other customers as well, like ONGC and just large petrochemical manufacturing plants that needed bikes. There were, I mean, put yourself in our shoes, right? So you, this is the first time we're earning money. We have we have enough money to have a small team, you know, live somewhere in a, in a house of sorts and, um, and, and build a product and build a company. So it feels like you made lots of progress. And this is my discovery of capitalism and my discovery of, of, of you know, the, uh, shares and the free market in the first place. So, so I already feel like I made progress. I had nothing. And then th through the will of my brain, we were able to, or our collective brains, we were able to build a product. And then that, that product could be put on site and someone's willing to give me money for it. Double thank you. Great. Okay. Then a new problem arises, which is it's not a very large market. And I'd never thought about it as, as a first-time entrepreneur who does not have any entrepreneurial background or experience. I'd never really considered market size as a problem. But it was very tough to scale in that every manufacturing plant had six, seven layers of hierarchy, multiple negotiations, a real pain in the ass. And while the administration of a campus were hell-bent on needing a green mobility solution because it ticked multiple boxes for them. The end user, the people riding the bikes, were using it only for health and fitness. Mm. There were very few mobility use cases and we knew because all the bikes would start and stop at the same junction and it all happen after lunch, early in the morning, right? So these are people who are coming to work and then saying, hey, I haven't gotten my workout for the day. I should go cycling. It's a big campus, beautiful roads. I should go cycling. And a lot of bike share companies at the time, so this is 2018, 19, right? This 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 time of history, were seeing similar trends and not saying it. So if you look at the Chinese bike shares, the Ofo, Blue Gogo, Mobike, those companies, they were seeing a large majority of use cases for health and fitness and not talking about it. Um, they, they sort of added to their ride graph and say we're having all these rides and sell as a mobility company, but they weren't a mobility company. And they were losing a lot of money on redistribution and all of those other problems. Um, and in India as well, lots of companies were having similar trends. So we were unwilling to, to acknowledge, just like they, they were, that this was true. And the reason for this was, it was so contrarian, so weird to say that I want to build a bike share, but not for mobility. Nobody had ever heard of it. And we were already in a comfortable spot. Somebody was paying us for the mobility was case. So, you know, why sort of kick the nest? And uh, for us, redemption came in the form of COVID. Because when COVID struck, all of our manufacturing plants shut down and all of our riders went back home. They went to their apartment complexes and they were cooped into their cages. And if you remember through COVID, bicycle retail, bicycle sales were through the roof because it was the most accessible health activity beyond walking and jogging that people could do and everybody wanted a bicycle. It was naturally socially distanced. And we had a huge market ahead of us, which is we could put our bikes in every in every apartment complex, uh, in, in a parks, any space that, that had a health and fitness use case where somebody was a walker or a morning jogger and wanted to get into cycling but just hadn't bought a bicycle and I'm happy to get into into what those insights were but that meant that we had to contend with the dragon we had to we had to acknowledge that we had to look under the carpet and say yeah all our rides are for health and fitness and we're pivoting the business it made it very easy for us so th there is there is some some element of the fact that the global climate with covid etc made it easy for us to to conduct that pivot where we could tell our tell everybody around us look you know, we'd love to do mobility, but it's just how the climate is now. But once we pivoted, all the numbers went through the roof, which is it became extremely apparent that that Indians want to cycle 
and they want to cycle a lot, save for buying the bicycle. There are three um, unintuitive things here, which we would not have figured out unless we put the bikes in these campuses. The first, like I said, lots of Indians want to get into cycling. And the anecdotal story that we get from everybody is, I went to a decathlon. I stood, I saw the bicycle, but I didn't buy it. And if I say, okay, why didn't you buy it? They say, you know what, it's like 10,000, 15,000 rupees. And I've seen so many bicycles lying in my basement. Now, I don't know if I have the, um, the wherewithal to pick up that habit and ride a bicycle uh, if so many others have failed, right? And if you have a shared bike, now suddenly there's, there's no asset investment. I'm, I'm willing to start cycling immediately. Second, cycling is a group activity. I would never have thought of it this way. But you want to cycle with somebody else, a friend, a spouse, a child. That's fundamentally what the activity is. And you're not able to do it if you buy a bicycle. The, the leading cause for not riding your bicycle once you buy one is because the person, you, your friend, your, your spouse, somebody you love and you want to share an activity but doesn't have a bicycle. And most Indians are unwilling to buy two or three per household. They've already bought one for the kid. Now they buy one for themselves, then buy one for the spouse, then it's too many bicycles. Um, third, repair and maintenance, right? So if I stop riding for two weeks because I undergo a busy spell or I'm sick and then in, in two weeks I go down to the basement, the bike is in a state of disrepair, I have to spend an hour fixing it. These are not things that Indians want to do. So all of a sudden, a shared bike inside the apartment complex solved these problems. I could simply walk downstairs and it's it's like a peloton for shared bikes, right? It's not in your house, but it's in your apartment complex. We don't lose any bikes because it's inside the apartment complex. Most of my riders go around the apartment complex perimeter. It's a flat road, good, good infrastructure, so no potholes, no traffic, so on and so forth, uh, safe space. So all those things sort of click together and then voila, we have a business. And that's what we sort of applied to YC with, we raised money on, we've been scaling that business. What sort of strikes me here is that all of these insights that you had, you could only have found them out by trying to do the wrong thing to begin with, which is that, you know, your initial thing is let me solve a problem for me. Your use case is mobility. You know, I got to get from here to there. And you're like, wow, okay, if I have this problem, other students have this problem, let me try to solve it. It is indeed a problem. But as you point out, you discover this much deeper problem. And the only way to do that was by putting bikes on the ground, as it were, which, you know, strikes me as a great metaphor for how we need to learn about the world, which is that, you know, books aren't enough, courses aren't enough. You actually have to go out there and do stuff and you sort of learn unexpected unintuitive things when you do that you mentioned that you could go deeper into the unintuitive learnings that you took out of that period when people were cooped up and all that in terms of their personal fitness and their attitudes and all that tell me a few more yeah so i mean on that list are these three things right which is indians want to cycle that that uh, you want to cycle in groups right so those are some things that they're not apparent from the face of it but I think it's the broader startup story in general. It is it is ripe with ripe with things that are heuristics that sort of don't make sense. But you have to do it in that particular way, and suddenly they start making sense, right? So I can give you a few examples, and I learned a lot of this from uh, do, doing Y Combinator because they tell this story over and over again. And if you read Peter Thiel's Zero to One, one of the things that he that he says is that as if if you know something unintuitive about a space you could shout it from rooftops and nobody will listen to you there's no such thing as somebody stealing your idea lots of entrepreneurs do this they they keep their idea close to their chest they don't talk about it and it's so unintuitive that you have to do the opposite which is to tell everybody about it and say hey i have this this idea and most people won't even believe you there's no queue of people waiting to steal your idea uh, most of them in fact are are there to to, to naysay and say that this doesn't make any sense yeah, so um, that, that's one example of an unintuitive truth that the the way to progress your belief is to speak about it and, you know, meet people and say, and potential competitors. Um, I remember talking to the Yulu founder. Uh, Yulu at the, at the time was a, was a competitor and I, I don't know, as a, as a first-time entrepreneur, presumed that I had the obligation to stay very silent and did the opposite where I sort of reached out and we had a conversation. And it was wonderful because he said, Deepak, this is exactly the same data we saw at Yulu, which is it's all health and fitness. So you're on the right track. We chose not to do that. They want to solve micromobility and so they've moved to e-scooters and other form factors. But all of a sudden, I had one a friend, somebody who who uh, I can now rely on, who can rely on me because we built a relationship um, upon a, a, a somewhat common goal that we're pursuing and a somewhat similar journey we've had over the last few years. And second, that it's it's validation, right, from from somebody else. And all of this could only have happened if I if I spoke about it. Um, that's unintuitive. Most Most young founders don't know that. When I did uh, did YC, I remember uh, the, the Dalton Dalton Gladwell, who's just phenomenal. I think he's a, a wealth of information uh, and knowledge and wisdom. Said, "Don't reply to an investment analyst." And I, th this was crazy to me. I'd spent three years replying to investment analysts. 
when some random weirdo from some you know VC firm writes in saying, "Hi Deepak, can I get thirty minutes? I'm interested in a call." I'd always say, "Yeah, of course," because you know maybe you give you maybe I fundraise like maybe you give me some money, and uh, we never raised from any investment analyst ever. And I never made I never made the connection that the reason I wasn't fundraising was because I was talking to the wrong people. The investment analyst is the wrong person to talk to. Uh, on average, an investment analyst probably gets one, two, three successful deals in the entire year. I'm likely to be in that subset of deals that are not successful. Most successful deals go straight. Through an LP or somebody very senior at the firm, uh, so if they they don't reach out, you're not interesting enough. This guy or this woman is just doing their job, which is to talk to X number of startups a day, and you're just one of those statistics. Super unintuitive, right? Um, which is, if you remember, I spoke at the previous uh, Ideas of India conference about how incubators are broken, and uh, I didn't touch on this at that at that talk. But one of the the big ways that they're broken is that. they do not preach these unintuitive truths and that is because they do not know it and lots of founders at these spaces are lost going down rabbit holes that seem completely reasonable and rational J- just imagine if if you know you receive a message in your inbox from somebody who's never going to give you money but seems like they are and you take this to a mentor and the mentor says wow wonderful you've received a message from you know big name bc reply to them at no point in that conversation would you say hey this this feels wrong this feels like something i shouldn't be doing it is the explicit it is only that person who can explicitly advise you in 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 why an un- intuitive truth is true that that value lies and so okay indian incubators in the indian early stages is just just sort of lacking in wisdom in these respects uh, but i learned this from vice and then chess and checkers right so vcs or investors in general are not playing the same game that that founders are are playing and we always think it as founders we think that if i just say hey look how much my users love my product then an investor is going to swoop in and say that's that's phenomenal here's you know 10 million dollars but founders never think of reframing the entire problem in in a way that the investor uh, sees selfish value which is they need a return on investment that's fundamentally what they're going after but there's something deeper the thing that's deeper is that in that that investors don't really know who's going to win they will never say it but nobody does no investor backed backed for example airbnb for a long time and even after they got into yc there were there were multiple naysayers and your job as a founder is to make the case that i am one of those possible shooting stars that you simply don't believe in today because you don't know enough it is to tap into the insecurity that an investor has because at the back of their mind and deep in their hearts they know that all they're doing is excel sheeting right they've they've made some assumption of okay industry x grows at cagr y and they've put this in an excel sheet and they have lps who demand returns and they promise certain return they have a fund 2 or fund 3 or fund x to raise and basis all those variables they've come to the conclusion that i have to put so many million dollars in these sorts of companies but they deeply insecure they they they're deeply unsure on whether these things are right or wrong just like you as a founder are unsure and insecure it's similar feelings they only present a face of of surety and you ought to do the same and you ought to to present in such a way that it it pulls at those strings and makes the case for of all the startups they're talking to every day every year why you ought to be the one to 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 get their um, to get their check and an, an an example of a way to do this unintuitive is to not give enough information which and i remember when making my first few pitch decks right i'd put everything on there i'd say look here's my business here's how fast revenue is growing here are my expenses my gross margins this is the the business that we're going after i'd say all of that in a single pitch deck and i'd be so surprised when investors look at that and say how will pass and what i learned from vice for example was to do exactly the opposite uh, which is to build intrigue each deck is just one one line long right getting around campuses is painful that's the that's the whole first slide we don't say anything else we don't explain the solution we don't say why we're, we're building this right uh, you draw a big circle in the middle of the deck and you say i don't know 50 billion dollar industry you just say that don't explain too much around what the industry is who users are so on and so forth and why why do we do this because investing is like a sales funnel so there has never been an investor in history who looks at it or very few i presume who has looked at a deck and then sent back an email saying i will invest x amount of money right we know that the next step in, in the investment journey is getting on a call and the only purpose of the deck is to get the investor on the call founders don't think about decks like this we think about decks as a way to prove that we're building a great business and that's not true a deck is in fact a way to get an investor on a call and the point of the first call is to get them on a second call and the point of the second call is to get into a due diligence and the point of the diligence is to get to the term sheet and you think about the entire fundraising journey as a funnel 
as a sales funnel which is so unintuitive it's advice i never received from many of the mentors that we were in the, in the early stages when i was still in college listening to so yeah here are some some examples of how that entire journey is, is fraught with things that are quite unintuitive mind blowing lots i want to double click on and first let's begin with talking about the sense of purpose that drives people to start a company in the first place like earlier at breakfast we were talking about the different ways in which uh, this can play out and one example we you came up with was uh, angad deryani who's who started his company with a sense of purpose and he's sticking to that sense of purpose there are many pivots possible which could be profitable in the short term but that sense of purpose having cleaner air in our cities is such a big thing that he will not compromise on that and that is a vision and he goes with that and equally there can be other founders who may start with a sense sense of purpose that is often less grandiose and could even be something like improve mobility in campuses but they are okay to pivot and they are okay to keep pivoting and uh, and i can kind of wonder about the mindset one has to have because i think there is a danger like if i might draw a sort of an uh, analog with the creator economy i would think that yeah you want to be open to change in the same way that this podcast went from being like 20 minute episodes to 7 hour episodes you want to be open to change but a the direction of this particular change was deeply unintuitive the market would never have told me this i had to do it and after doing it i figured out it worked and the only reason i did it was because i wanted to do it it was driven uh, by my own uh, sort of curiosities and my own aesthetic sense of what is working and i think there is a danger of following a market too far in the sense that then you are constantly trying to second guess what the customer wants and there is a possibility of a race to the bottom and at some point you have to have a vision and you have to say right okay this is how i'll do it so how does one think about this that you begin with purpose now how much should you pivot and when i think pivoting is great i of course pivoted in almost everything i have done but i have not just blindly tried to uh, you know uh, follow the money as it were how do you think about this i mean there's a ship of theseus quality to it also that a company can become completely different in terms of purpose by just pivoting too yeah. much i i i love the example we we discuss this quite frequently i don't know what a company is it's quite hard. it's ineffable uh, it's it's I don't know. Is it is it the founders? We, if we leave the company, company stays. It's not our users. It's not the shareholders. It's nothing. It's just an intersubjective, ineffable, floating entity. Yeah. So I think pivoting is to walk the narrow path. It is the hardest thing that that you can do in the early stage journey, because a reductionist way of looking at the startup journey is you start with an idea, you get to product market fit, then you scale the business, and in that first part, the idea to product market fit sort of journey. the most difficult thing to do is to pivot uh, or perhaps second to quitting which is also something that you have to take call on some point if you say that i'm i've been pivoting endlessly but i haven't so when to quit is 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 you know probably just as hard but it's one of the hardest things that you have to do and it's for exactly the reason that you mentioned we have to we have to balance those two difficult things which is one what is the user telling us um, and how do we know that what they're telling us is true and how do we test that so and then you have to get into all these practical problems of how do you build an mvp how do you test how do you ab test um, how do you observe users how do you collect feedback right nps pmf calculations so all of that is is one side of this this journey and the second is that you still have to set vision you as a founder have to say for example if we say that okay we're building a a health and fitness company now and and bicycles are the base of it uh, there has to be vision for what you deliver that is not obvious for the rider like how do you build a car instead of building a faster horse right so you identify the problem you need faster mobility and then a poor founder builds uh, a, a, you know breeds faster horses a great founder uh, builds the car uh, or an airplane or something um and maybe an airplane is is too futuristic and maybe today it is a car right so that walking the narrow path is i think the the difficult part of the entire journey i don't think there's any easy answers but i i think it's you you need to get lots lots of things right to be able to do it building good companies is is in large degree luck so you need to have the right co-founders and i was very blessed to find uh, rajit and daksh who are were incredible co-founders to have it's the leading cause of why uh, why startups fail um you need to start up at the right time you may have an idea that's simply too early or too late and not just in time and you have to explain it why is this the right time to build this business as opposed to 5 years earlier 10 years earlier because if it could have been built 10 years earlier why has nobody built it this there certainly must be a reasonable uh, explanation and 
to to get all of that in place then you need to have those those conversations which is hey here's what the data says now we spend 2 hours trying to figure out if the data is right and what it really means because it seems like it means something but is that what it really means and how do we test for this then you have to dip your toes into the pool very slowly before you don't don't dive head first right and so you, you dip a little bit and you see does is, is this in line with the hypothesis we've laid out and if no why not um, so it's a, it's a very complex w- the question you've laid out is the early stage journey and it's that really difficult process earlier we were talking about grit and determination as those criteria by which somebody wins a swimming race right um, and seems to be approximately what the filter is which is how many hours you're able to sit at a table and study a book and memorize every single thing and let go of everything else in your life um, and then you make a great a great employee or whatever it is um, i think it's also true for founders so okay. it's become apparent to me in the last few years of building that if there is if there is one criteria that determines success in startup building it is grit it is not iq in fact very smart founders tend not to do very well because they wake up every day and their brain tells them that this is so idiotic you could just be working a 50 lakh per annum 1 crore per annum job and you know have everything that your heart desires if that's what your heart desires and not have to slave your way through um, this whole idea to pmf journey the pre pmf space is is and I, i don't think grit is a sufficient condition but in my estimate the only necessary condition which is what also makes good investors good investors bet on gritty founders unintuitive but f- investors who ask questions like give me a five year projection uh, for your business are bad investors because they're not they're not testing for grit they're testing for ability to do a discounted discounted cash flow and pre product market fit what the hell is a fire projection how do you even know what you're building exactly right so okay so you you certainly need need to be uh, the only necessary condition that i've been able to identify so far is grit uh, everything else is 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 hard i mean once you have grit then you have to be lucky enough to have all the other factors fall into place like i said mentors co-founders the the broader ecosystem all of those things have to fall into place and then you have to walk the narrow path from idea to product market fit and um, and if you don't get a product market fit make that harder choice which is okay this is not working i'm going to quit and either come up with a new idea or take a break and come back so those i have no easy answer but i don't think that exists an easy answer that skill set of of how you get to product market fit in a combination of on one side your vision um, your aspirations hopes and dreams the the future you lay out in front of you and on the other side that which your data reflects and that your user tells you the bringing together of those two in in some sort of poetry is the hard task that entrepreneurs have ahead of them just thinking aloud i mean any rational founder could both know that grit is important but would also know that the examples of the gritty people who have made it represent a kind of selection bias that most gritty people don't make it simply because most people don't make it and that would at certain stages lead to huge amounts of self doubt and i'm curious about two kinds of journeys you would have made during this period one is learning about yourself and growing in yourself the attributes that you feel uh, you need and two is learning about what it is to have a company where you might begin with just the founders and then you have 10 employees and then you have 30 employees and as you grow how do you manage egos how do you you know figure out all of that stuff so you know take me through sort of both of these and maybe start with yourself like what did you learn about yourself through this process and at what point of the journey does a realization strike you that it's really about staying the distance and were there moments of self doubt where you also confronted the most difficult question like you said of should i quit or should i stay and sometimes obviously it the you know you should know when the, what the right time to quit is but sometimes you stay a little bit longer and things work out yeah the i think one of something that i left childhood with was the belief that i am somebody who does not quit i don't know why i i hold that belief because there certainly are times when you should quit that's completely reasonable but i tied to my ego the success not even the success the the lack of quitting which is if i quit then i am not the person that i am it became fundamental to my to my character as a human being as good luck would have it not quitting was was good in this particular journey i'm certain that there are some journeys uh, along which i should have quit a lot earlier or uh, or perhaps that i should have quit a lot earlier but that played a big role in the early days so when we first started up i started up with a forementioned best friend who's gone to japan and 
we had a very hard talk towards the end of college where he wanted to get a job and take a more traditional approach for the first few years potentially potentially revisit starting up later in his life and i felt the opposite which was if there was a time to be super risky it was now much later in life i don't know what will happen but today things are reasonably stable that i can plunge and we had to split and for a long time that journey was quite alone just me building um, and a uh, luckily i had a few other mentors and people like that around me um, and then a few months in i met rachit and daksh so then i had the good fortune of finding the right co-founders i think i didn't quit simply because it was a matter of of who i was as a person it was fundamental to me that if there if there's one thing that deepak is he is not a quitter right um, okay so so that's my personal answer but along the way i think i i discovered the boundaries that i had for myself and a, a good example is when we first started we would we would build day and night it was a it was a race not a marathon uh, and you don't know any better right when you first start up that it's going to be a, i mean we were okay theoretically i said yeah this is a couple of decades i have no problem with it but practically building something for a couple of decades is very hard it requires quite a bit of discipline a lot of structure in your life and we didn't approach it like that i said if i if if i work twice as hard as everybody else and two hour, twi- twice as long then i get twice as much work done um, and that's the approach that we took um, i'm i'm not sure i i advise for it or against it today for other founders pick what makes most the most sense to you but it worked well for us because otherwise it would take me much longer to get to product market fit and beyond but today as as founders we look back and we don't think that's the right way to structure our lives in fact we we've, we've taken a lot more uh, mellow approach to the to, to the day which is you have to make time for other things you know exercise get your tooling right uh, take days off if you need it go on a hike if that's what you want do all those things and it your journey your company is better off for it so that's for example something that i learned along the way uh, which is it, it, it makes no sense and we never actually burnt out we never came to a place where one of us said hey i'm burnt out but we could see it coming the three of us have something called the dumpster fire uh, hypothesis which is all all good founders can see the dumpster fire coming you can it's down the road and from where you stand if you're being honest you can see that that something is on fire it could be that your retention is shit it could be that your users don't actually love your product it could be that running out of money whatever it is you can see it coming when you see new stories of of founders who are now not paying their employees or have sort of blown up all their money or a fire festival type outcome those are all founders who refused to acknowledge the dump, the dumpster fire they saw it and didn't acknowledge it and i think for us burning out was one of those dumpster fires we saw it from afar and we said if we continue down this path then we 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 burn ourselves and so we shouldn't do it uh, and we've continued to follow that approach till today so that was a boundary that i think we identified along the way which is um, and you, sometimes the dumpster fire is so far beyond the horizon that you don't see it but as you walk towards it you see it and then you sort of morph so I think that's something I realized about myself, which is tied to my identity is the fact that I don't quit, uh, which I probably should work on, um, and and I have since become at least acknowledging of that I am this sort of person. And so sometimes when I'm not quitting stubbornly, then I, I realize that it not, doesn't come from a rational place, but rather from a, from a place that is simply egotistical, and and that that there are boundaries, and part of the journey is to discover what those boundaries are. When it so. I also think that uh, I don't know to what degree my narration of my story is valuable to other founders. This this is super individual. Uh, it matters so much what sort of childhood you had and where you grew up and what are those things that you, that you hold so dear to your heart. I've seen lots of founders who are simply dhanda karna hai, and these are founders who do really well. By the way, most of India's top entrepreneurs are just people who want to make money, which is solid, right? But this is not a philosophical expedition. I remember on the, on the contrary yeah. I'd say that everything that you're saying about being a founder in startups I think I feel like it applies to me also of that course. I need to look ahead in my own life and see the dumpster fires coming and I can while you were talking I was thinking back on dumpster fires I have seen in the past and ignored mm-hmm. so I, I I think it's actually uh, it is probably it applies uh, not to less people than you think but more people than you think yeah perhaps right and because you're thinking about it from the broader perspective of not just companies but just in general yeah i think th- that's how that's the sort of personality types that all three of us are so i was saying something but i forgot the point your second question was uh, how does this the company in 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 terms of the yeah. company like uh, just you know like you said for a long time that journey was solo but then you have the co-founders yes. tell me a little bit about that story because if i remember correctly from the conversations i've had with you guys you didn't have to make them co-founders it's a it's a choice that yep. you made yep. and why did you make that choice and then how is it working on that relationship and then when you start building a company you start getting employees it's very different running a uh, 
company where it's just the three of you to where there are 10 employees to where there are 30 employees to maybe thinking ahead now and you know uh, thousands of employees how many do you have right now we're not a very big team so uh, white collar staff all of our mechanics all put together about 50 people is, is how large we are today the it's it's a good it's it's an interesting question and i think th- there's an example that is a good analogy which is a game of mario kart um or um, have you played dx ball mm-hmm. growing up okay mm-hmm. so um, or have you played dev okay. yeah yeah back in the day of perfect course. okay yeah, yeah. yeah so you have 10 levels of dev mm-hmm. right each of those levels are different on one of those levels you start off playing and the monster looks a particular way and shoots a particular kind of pellet at you and the controls work uh, in, in a particular way and so on and so forth and you it spend you spend some time trying to figure out that particular level at some point you master it and once you do you go down the the chimney and into level 2 and level 2 suddenly completely different the there's water everywhere you're floating uh, jumping means moving upwards not downwards the monster looks different and suddenly everything that you've learned at the previous level has to change and you have to evolve uh, and there are in the analogy two skill sets here the first identifying when a level has changed that's not so easy when you build a company making the call to hire your first employee is the acknowledgement that hey this level has changed three people or two people or just a single founder is not enough and then second how how quickly do you learn that new the the rules of the new level which is hard because you first have to document the rules of the new level and it's it's a good example is when you are not a funded company you've not raised any capital the way that you behave and act is very different than the way you behave and act once you've raised let's say money from investors or you even make enough money to start paying other people the things that you focus on and spend your time on completely different now I, again here i think it's fairly personalized the recognition that level has changed is very founder specific some may be very ambitious and say look i know that this is coming in the future so i'm going to jump levels right now higher preemptively uh, i don't recommend it in fact i recommend moving slower than you should and and hiring later than you should simply because if you if you if you hire too soon you burn all your money then you're in trouble it's okay to go slow i feel like uh, alarmism about comp- competition is overrated burning money to uh, grab market share is not a good idea right these are all unintuitive first principles but you just shouldn't do them and you you learn this from other people you can literally go on the internet and watch paul graham or michael siebel or any of the great indian entrepreneurs speak for an hour and they will all say approximately the same thing right? and those truths are true and you can you can presume that it's true at least for the sake of your journey but the, that second skill of being able to learn rapidly the rules of your new level um, that's that's really hard um, and it's so contextual that you can receive vague advice from other people but that's that's sort of where the value of an entrepreneur truly shines in the recognition that a level has changed and then how fast i learn the, the new rules so i can i can transition my entire team to that space for us we'd spent a lot of time at level 1 which is we started off in college and i was happy to even get to revenue and then to get to a bottom line where people were paying us money and we had enough left over for the next month um then when we pivoted to apartment complexes i think that was level 2ish for us because all of a sudden um it was not strictly profitable in the way that a that a traditional business is profitable um we had to make capital investments at the outset you know a lot more complicated math a lot of bets had to be made today to reap and in, in some some future um so that was our sort of level 2 for us and then once we raised money and we became a venture backed business uh, at least on paper that that became level 3 i'm sure there are hundreds of levels ahead of ahead of us today but i don't know if it strictly applies to everybody else but those two things will still be invariably true for your business when does level change how do you adapt to when it changes and and how is it being a boss how is it de- you know dealing with your co-founders for example you know that part of the story uh, where uh, you decide that you want them to be co-founders rather oh, than right, yes. employees so they joined as employees both of them but when you're so early stage i mean i was the only person running the company practically and it's not like we had customers i just had an idea right i don't think the word employee means anything everybody does an equal share of work you distribute nobody says no to anything there's no domain you're un- unwilling to work in and those are things you test for you test for whether these people are willing to work across domains are willing to treat this like their own business and both of them certainly did dux dropped out of college to join tilt and uh, rachit in fact joined the incubation to build his own company and then joined us to help with some of the hardware and then said okay this is all like solid i like the idea we should we should dive deep into this and both of them joined much before we pivoted to apartment complexes before we got into yc right so there, there was no shining star in fact it was just a pile of shit it's quite hard to look at this and say yeah this can turn into something that's a, a, a true and right business and most startups fail 
the one thing that i was initially lucky to have was that it was apparent that they both had a very entrepreneurial bent of mind they didn't want to go down the traditional path of getting a job and all of that um, and they were they were willing to stand up to the pressures that be societal pressures that say that they ought to do that they were already willing to be fighty about it and say look you know i am the master of my fate i am the captain of my soul which was already a very good sign that these are the sorts of people that that i could fall in love with right these are these are sorts of people who i want to surround myself with in life and i think maybe a few months into it it became very clear that all three of us were were going to build this together for the long run it's it's only good fortune if if i'd met a, met different sorts of uh, some different type of person or people i don't know if it would have transpired the exact same way i don't know if i if i would have been just as comfortable saying okay let's go found this but but with them it sort of came to us naturally and we all shook hands the wonderful thing about being co-founders with them is we've never we've never had a fight never it's been 6 years we've never argued about something well i think argued is the wrong we never fought we argue vehemently right and i think that's because uh, underpinning each of those arguments is the recognition that we're all rowing the boat in the same direction so to go back to an early example that i had and i've seen founders fall apart over which color what color the button should be if i say red you know that i'm saying it ought to be red because i care deeply about the success of the company and if you say green i you, i know that you're saying green because you care deeply about the success of the company so underpinning that argument that we're having is the acknowledgement that we have a mutual goal right we simply differ on, on you know the particulars and how we want to get there but it has not changed that 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 long that stick that we've placed so far in the future is in exactly the same spot for you and me which makes navigating this conversation so easy and uh, again that's 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 some providence some grace that has been issued to me that i've been able to find co-founders who communicate really well uh, and that we can have these conversations um, and then i think it it became very important for us to learn how to how to argue which means that if if we disagree about something color of the button per se uh, for example and what sort of so- sorts of solutions can we get to and are we arguing about things that shouldn't be argued about you know can can we just toss a coin and say okay it's red and move on with it or are these things that we have to ab test so we'll half the app will ship with with you know feature 1 half the app with feature 2 we'll come back in 2 weeks test the data can it be shipped chronologically that is today we ship 1 and then 2 weeks later 2 and then we see which of those have have uh, have proved to be better um, and so that is a learning game where depending on the case we've sort of learned each other's temperaments and and how we behave and how we interact with each other um finally i think it also really helped i live with my co-founders we started living together right out of college when we started building the company and to this date we have a 3 bhk um in kamnali in bangalore where we live and so i mean we work we work from home it's a fully remote company we work in our in our boxes the entire day and having a shared space with them where i can walk into the other person's room and say hey what the fuck you know this broke and then the other person says yeah but so and so and then we're able to like sort of hash that out and fix it um is just wonderful um it's it, it, lots of founders don't have it so easy and we certainly do and we're lucky that way so i don't know if again transpires exactly to all your listeners or anybody building a business but this has been our experience i i uh, learned this phrase again from uh, jeff bezos's uh, episode with lex friedman which was uh, disagree and commit where he will say he will yeah. often have an argument as a ceo and he might disagree but he will be realize that at some point the matter has to be resolved and sometimes when he sees the conviction of the other person he will say fine i disagree but now i will commit yes. which means i will never come back to you and say that hey fuck you you know i said this or i knew this would happen or i knew it wouldn't work you disagree and commit which seems a sort of a beautiful way to resolve arguments outside the context of a company as well i think it's it's something in any yes. relationship and again i heard this in some podcast i forget who but it was in the context of person relationships where um, this person was talking about how he and his wife hash out arguments and he said the way we do it is each of us assigns a number out of 10 to it how intensely we feel about it <laughs> and if hers is 9 and mine is 6 i'll just give up and vice versa and the only real problem is when they are both 9 and what do you do and i guess in the heat of battle everything can seem like an 11 out of 10 so you know before we go in for a break a sort of a final question and uh, about the company that struck me that when you speak about having alignment on a goal you know how do you define that goal because the goal could be something as narrow as help people become fitter by uh, you know shared bicycles right. or it could be something much broader as in make india fitter you know so what is that goal how do you think about that goal again i think two ways to do this you we learned at yc to set two week goals two week goals are the best way to build a business uh, we broadly do that uh, you could be monthly quarterly whatever it is but you want to set a goal for what 
and the way to do this is to pick a key metric so this is my mathematical answer to the question right so not so philosophical you set a, a numerical goal saying i'd like to grow at x percent week on week or this is the, the metric to hit and the the hard part in that is finding the key metric the best key metric is revenue because that's what you want to grow but if it's not revenue it could be anything else uh, but you, you pick a key metric and across domains so for customer support the metric will be different than from sales than from operations whatever and then it's not so difficult once you pick the key metric and you all agree on how fast you want to grow and how all these various functions intermingle then you can set numerical goals and you can you can end up achieving them but those numerical goals still have to be subservient to some long term goal right? which is i think what your question is and f- given that we're the sorts of founders who've been pivoting quite quite comfortably i think our long term goal is and if i think for example about the the bike share for health and fitness right that's that's sort of the the ethos of what's being built today it's to bring that to as many people as possible so as to as many indians as possible we'd like to deliver cycling in a new form factor the the unintuitive bit here is that people don't people want to cycle but they don't want to buy a bicycle and the 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 startup or the company that that overthrows a 200 300 400 year old retail cycle model is not another re- retail cycle startup it's not somebody who's manufacturing a new kind of bicycle it's somebody who delivers the same experience in a completely new form factor and all of a sudden millions of people who never wanted to who want to get into cycling but never wanted to buy the bicycle are now willing to ride a bicycle right and of course you layer it with an app and gamification leaderboards all the the nice things that come with with having software on top of this so I think we've agreed on that which is we have a whole new form factor to deliver bicycling in we know that Indians want to get into cycling and we'd like to move as aggressively as possible to get these bikes into all those spaces where then people can come in and lock and ride and have those wonderful experiences um so that 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 long term vision has been agreed upon because it it feels so exciting to have figured out something about the market that nobody else knew before nobody else knew that you could put shared bikes in an apartment complex and suddenly people stop buying bicycles and riding them more frequently um and then once you know that uh, you have to do all the math which is how much money have i raised how much debt can i possibly get how do we finance our assets how many employees can we hire what does the the balance sheet look like you do you do your monthly review so you you have some numerical underpinnings um and then using that you say okay if our goal is to to grow as aggressively as possible what is the most aggressive safe number that we can pick for this month the next month the next quarter the next year so on and so forth and then you you put that number in place you revisit it frequently and then from that number everything else flows which is then what are the numbers for revenue for let's say growth retention uh, all of the other you know little bits that that fall into place yeah so i mean i know that companies have all these mission statement vision statement right it seems a bit cliche in fact we've been asked to write down ours and we've never been able to but broadly i think it's that i think we've we've discovered a new way to deliver cycling to people which we 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 love doing uh, how do we grow that as aggressively as possible Marvelous. Let's take a quick commercial break, and on the other side of the break, we shall continue. Thank you. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end. of it the course costs rupees 10000 plus gst or about 150 dollars if you're interested head on over to register at indiauncut.com/clearwriting that's indiauncut.com/clearwriting being a good writer doesn't require god given talent just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills i can help you Welcome back to the scene and the unseen I'm still here with Deepak Vyas and in a sense there is a feel of groundhog day to my welcoming you back because we made a false start after the break a little while back and what happened was we made a false start we started speaking about something and then I started sneezing like a maniac and I just sneezed for 5 minutes and we had to stop that and in between we said let's wait for a while and etc etc and it was terrible and I wondered what I had done to deserve this surely I must have committed some sin in my past life or perhaps in the past star but here we are we have restarted and hopefully my antihistamine is uh, sort of kicking in i want to start by sort of 
you know just zooming out of the the narrow frame of worldly activities as it were which mm-hmm. we were talking about yeah, earlier and yeah. talking about something that has uh, sort of preoccupied me a lot over the last few years in a sort of a very low intensity way in the sense that it's there at the back of my mind i care deeply about it but i haven't actually intensely sat down and studied it and thought about it a lot but i know that i have to which is moral philosophy and and you mentioned that that was one of the things that you came to early in your life you know thinking about what is good and what is not so you know take me a little bit through through that journey yeah N- not so early to be honest uh, in fact when you are in a very empirical space which is and i took a very science based early few years i don't think metaphysics is a large part of that discourse it's all real in the world physics and you never question why something is moral you can just say something like yes rape is bad and it's as simple as that right it does not need justification and while it's easy for more black and white topics it becomes harder when there is a gradient and when presented with that gradient then you are forced to reconcile all your first principles right so that's sort of how how i came to it and i think it's been a few 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 years of reading um, i'm quite quite a newbie to this entire space so i'm sure many of your listeners are are significantly more well read well versed but the thing that i i find to be most interesting in all of this is to dig into why a person believes what they believe and i'm i'm speaking of course philosophically or uh, even politically why do you hold those first principles that you hold they must tie to some first some belief in some sort of moral landscape and we were talking at breakfast about how sometimes words just don't mean the sorts of things that we intend for them to mean a moral landscape is codified by a good and a bad uh, something is good in in that it is better than something that is bad in that it is worse than something that it is good and you 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 put these two poles apart and you build a moral landscape the first challenge i think is that the words themselves don't do any justice so good can be used in lots of ways you are my good friend the sandwich was good um i saw a good movie and so on and so forth so the word good means uh, means something else and of course that he or she is a good person i was also saying that if you remember that good could could mean something about the the moral landscape itself so you could say that here is a moral landscape and you for example may say i think that consent is good so two two people should be able to shake hands on something and be able to execute that and coercion is bad so we've drawn a, we've drawn some sort of a landscape here and then you could say that that moral landscape itself is a good moral landscape so you're saying that some good is good as opposed to a good being bad uh, which is which is all kinds of muddy and i think it's a consequence of just not having the right sorts of words uh, to describe this moral landscape in so broadly that, that that has has intrigued me quite a bit and this spills over to everything else right your per- interpersonal relationships how you conduct your day or week your life how you build a business how you interact with customers employees all of that is in some way impacted by what you at your core think of as a moral landscape one way to go about answering this is to use the man behind your face that we'd spoken about earlier that that intuitive sense from deep within you that that is an arrow and points towards what you think is good or better which is fine and it's it seems to be what most people do uh, and I, i don't really have a strong refutation to why we ought not do it except that it is not objective there is no reason there is no reasonable reason <laughs> that your intuition is right just like a psychopath may have the intuition to and a deep deep earning yearning in, intuition to to kill 50 people or a serial killer or any of those things um, and we can point at their intuitions and say that it is it is bad uh, there is no reason why your intu- intuition is good or bad um, which is not to say that a psychopath is, is a great person to model your life after but that is the question uh, how do you model your own life and your interactions with others and all the other things that come with with um, having to decode a moral space I think as far as the uh, nebulousness of language is concerned I couldn't agree with you more Swapna little did this great episode with me where she told me about how history is both you know the events of the past as well as a study of the events of the past and conflating one with the other can often be so uh, dangerous and there is that whole wittgensteinian notion that you know that there are many things in the world that cannot be described and of course his injunction therefore was to shut up about them but there are many things that some languages describes but not others which is you know a, a sideways point one of the benefits of being multilingual and i keep referring on this podcast to borges's short story about a map of the world 
where a good map of the world has to be as big as the world itself. Yeah. And obviously, my addition to that is that it's out of date the next moment because the world is constantly changing. No, but I ask this sort of question of morality because our public discourse has also become incredibly judgmental, and it's become incredibly judgmental in in a sense that morality, good and bad, are constantly being invoked. That if you disagree with someone, they're not only wrong, but they are also bad, and that's what our uh, discourse driven by social media has perhaps degenerated to. And to me, that seems driven not by a quest for truth or virtue but by vanity you know like when you pass judgment on someone what are you saying you're saying you're better than that person that is driven by vanity you want to project yourself as someone who is more knowledgeable or more uh, quote unquote virtuous and you know and and when i think of instincts you know our instincts evolved in evolved in prehistoric times in various sort of ways for particular reasons and even the man behind the face therefore is not so appealing to me like w e h lecky wrote this great book circa i think 1899 or so called uh, history of european morals where he coined the term the expanding circle and his point was that intuitively we are born caring only for our family everyone else is another from there that expands to perhaps include the extended family to include the tribe to include the nation once you have a conception of that and eventually the argument is that it should expand to include all of mankind in fact peter singer wrote a book called the expanding circle where yep. he's saying it should go to animals as well right now whatever one makes of that the truth is none of this is intuitive we learn to behave in these ways but given circumstance i think i would argue we default to what hannah arendt called the banality of evil that each of us can do the most terrible things no matter what positions of virtue we might otherwise take so i think about that and what worries me particularly is how you know virtue is so tied in with communities and groups like the way that i look at the world and i think you broadly share the same way and i once meant to write a book about it perhaps i will someday i've been thinking about it for years is where i ask myself two fundamental questions one is how should i live my life mm -hmm. and you know in terms of relating to other people and all that and the other is what should be the relation between society and the state mm -hmm. and uh, most people will consider these two questions to be in different domains but my answer for both is the same and that is consent and at its heart is individual freedom that that is how individuals flourish and societies flourish if we have freedom as a centerpiece of that and i would argue in our personal lives we are all libertarian because you know three of us will go to a restaurant and we won't order for the other person or force the other person to pay but when it comes to the state and society we turn a blind eye on coercion immediately but my you know to both you and me that might seem a common sensical approach but it is actually very much the minority approach because most people think more in terms of group rights and individual rights when people talk of welfare like when you talk of utilitarianism they're thinking of the welfare of society and as both on the right and the left the right will of course you know think in terms of groups and think in terms of group rights but so does the left these days like to me wokeism begins where liberalism ends if liberalism in its classical sense is about the individual wokeism is about building narratives of victimhood and um, uh, oppression on the basis of groups and uh, on the basis of group identities and therefore it is incredibly simplistic and reductive it reduces every man to either one identity or a basket of identities but does not acknowledge the you know the individual autonomy or agency of the individual somehow you are either a victim or an oppressor always and i find you know all of this sort of deeply disturbing what what, what are your thoughts on these yeah a few things that came to mind as you were talking the first was li recently listening to peter singer speak and he mentioned that he eats oysters which stood out to me because this is a gentleman who since the 1980s at least has been espousing i mean effectively the father of of uh, modern veganism um, and and also probably the the person to make popular the idea that you could be speciesist in yeah. some way right um, but who also advocated once for killing infants like actually born infants if humanity would benefit from that a controversial position he took right and i think the the oyster eating position is, is fairly controversial among his followers as well mm. but i'm i'm able to appreciate the the rigor in his first principle thinking which is he says look at the base of it all i am a utilitarian and from all the data we know about things that feel or don't feel oysters don't feel in killing an oyster and zoologists can confirm this according to whatever research they have done in his belief they they don't really suffer 
and so it is akin to eating a plant right and so there is there is some there is some rigor in his ability to hold a first principle all the way through despite it alienating a certain subset of his followers yeah so i think that 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 ties back to what we were talking about earlier which is what are your first principles and for some people it's it's as simple as saying look i'm a utilitarian and they're happy to get into the the weeds on what that means and for some people it's a lot more complicated where it's issue based and they have lots of first principles and they all compete and i find myself in this category quite frequently in which case i have to assign a hierarchy to my values and sometimes those those hierarchies change from issue to issue and sometimes the the value itself is questioned when a new issue arises and so on and so forth uh, but but yeah, Or, this is that and i don't think it's solvable for for tens of thousands of years we've been thinking about this very deeply um, which is also why i, I understand political positions the, you know we could sit and debate forever but we still have to do things in the real world and if you remember aristotle's philosopher king or sorry plato i think in the Plato's, republic yeah, yeah for the philosopher king I've been arguing for a long time for philosopher CEOs because it's also very important for people who lead organizations today that they have enough enough sway over for example how cronyism plays out in a state uh, because there is a second party to this that that it's important to 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 you know have the right first principles right again being subjective and and just like good um, yeah so broadly I agree with you but I don't have any clear answers um, and and I agree with you also on the fact that that intuition is is not an easy answer it's the best that we i mean i feel like it's one of the best that we have uh, you could use well-being as well so this is the sam harris position which is uh, morality by definition is one that enhances well-being and so um, any subset of beliefs or policy that continues to enhance well-being is good will of course run into all the same problems which is what is well-being how do you quantify it well-being for whom how many crickets makes a grasshopper how many pigeons makes a cow and we will probably never get to the basis of the i mean the, the answers to those questions but it's it's i mean i'm finding great pleasure in exploring those questions and then of course looking in the mirror and seeing if uh, i have similar faults and flaws can you talk about an actual uh, sort of conflict you face between what you call the hierarchy of values like i imagine one typical conflict that might be is if you value freedom but you also value life mm -hmm. right and i value consent more than anything else and therefore I i'm pro choice because you know you might talk to me about uh, the importance of life and the life of the little fetus that might be within a woman but to me the woman's consent uh, is paramount she owns her body that's a right to self ownership but that is uh, again my subjective sort of set of values where i'm saying that yeah. no i'm putting consent on top there's no ob objective way to come at a set of values so mm. what kind of sort of and and uh, conflicting situations have you faced right yeah G good question i think that I know that the uh, the abortion discussion is a minefield, and both of us men sitting in a room discussing abortion is, is uh, probably compounding that. And as an aside, uh, this is why when when people resort to a book as a way to justify a position, whatever that book is, secular or not, uh, I don't think it's the whole answer that needs to be fleshed out. There is a first principle in the book that justifies that position, and you still have to defend that first principle. Okay, so this is a good example. I think that the the ability for someone who is pregnant. to be able to revoke consent at any moment in time and say i no longer want a person inside of me right is is something that people who hold consent dear will say makes complete sense it makes complete sense that you should be able to revoke consent we do it all the time right and people who think that life is a pinnacle value on that hierarchy to and it's we've taken a long time to to flesh that one out as well there's a game i played with a friend called name the trait which is if you are in a lake and equidistant from you is a is a drowning child and a drowning pig most people almost all people will swim towards the child and save the child no no questions asked okay but but we have to go backwards so i mean at some point if equidistant from you there was a man and a woman most people would have swum towards the man because there was there was some hierarchy in even legally speaking in in value assigned to sex and gender then that became race right so we stop being sexist we stop being racist and the question is why don't you stop being speciesist right why is a why is a pig less or more or less valuable than a child and then so on and so forth Th these sorts of arbitrary positions are possible but but in so far as the last few hundred years have gone we've arrived at this place where we say all human beings are equal not to not to the individual right to you of course somebody may be more or less valuable than somebody else so for some people their dog is significantly more valuable than a human being but as a collective group of people right we've we've pinnacleized this this value so it's taken us a long time to get here in the first place um and the same is true for consent it was fairly hard i mean when you were speaking with with rahul matan the example that he gave of, of for example living wall to wall peering into each other's houses all of that was is, is i don't i don't think even the ability to execute consent was so clearly laid out and we we made quite a bit of if the word is progress progress on that 
So in, in, in the abortion question, people who hold that value to life as pinnacle will say that whenever it is life, whatever that is, it could be a heartbeat, the first you know, a couple of cells, whatever it is, then it's a human being. And so uh, what's disappointing though is, is the reduction of these positions to sloganeering, which is you know on one side you'll say something like abortion is murder, on the other side you'll say something like my body, my choice. It misses the, the philosophy underpinning this uh, nuanced understanding of what the other person is saying. And then of course, and, and invariably, all this has real-life consequences. I mean, real people have to struggle with, for example, not being able to get abortions, being forced to carry a child to term, right, so on and so forth. Um, or or having to contend with the fact, if you feel so deeply about life, that there are fetuses that are, quote-unquote, dying, right? Not easy. Uh, and I think that that I'm one of those people who have these conflicting first principles. I think consent is super important. I'd like to be treated in a way that is non-coercive. I'd like to be asked before something is done to me, of me. The... Um, I also hold my own life as as extremely valuable in that I should be able to relinquish it at my own at my own at my own consent uh, as opposed to somebody else choosing for me the quality of my life should be in my own control so on and so forth yeah so that's a good example it's a good example of where you have two conflicting first principles and it's when we have these contentious discussions, I think it's very important, and that, that's why I do this, to figure out what the other person's first principles are. If you, I mean, if you remember before I was talking about how when we all build a company, we're, we're all going the same direction. If you're not, then you can never agree on the color of a button. Um, so before policy, before I think at the outset is to lay out first principles and sort of discuss that in detail. It gives a very deep appreciation to somebody else's perspective. Um, in that, okay, maybe I don't agree, or you 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 favor one of these principles higher in the hierarchy than I do, but I understand it because I'm not too different. I also have my own first principles. They're also arbitrary in some way. They also drive towards some ends that I feel are more important. That makes for I think deeper discourse. It's why I stay for, stay off social media. I don't have an account on. I have an account, but I don't really do anything on these accounts. It's I don't know how much you can fit in 140 characters or these really short posts. Uh, nuances like this, I think, where you and I sit down and we do hours and maybe at the end of it, we, we, we come away with some deep appreciation for the other person's perspective and some way to find common middle ground. At, at this point, I must inform uh, our listeners that in the last two conferences where we have spent a lot of time together, especially in the last one, I remember on like probably the fourth day we were together across these two conferences, uh, you kept coming to me and saying, let's find something we disagree on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you would say something controversial and I would be like, but I agree. Or I would say something controversial and you would be uh, like, I agree, which includes antinatalism and consent and uh, a vast uh, swath of things. But I'm confident, we'll, like right now, uh, you know, you had the hope that we can disagree about free will but it turns out both of us agree there is no free will and therefore I guess we have no choice but to find something else and I say no choice <laughs> but to find uh, uh, something else to another question you use the term philosopher CEO do we need one and I actually think in a manner of speaking I think Bezos is one I also think Musk is one whether you like his philosophy or not he's Musk, a thinker yeah. And, um, uh, you know, Paul Graham, of course, is a great philosopher, though I don't know if he's a CEO, a philosopher investor, perhaps, of sorts. Sam Altman is a philo philosopher CEO now that he is a CEO. And I wonder to what extent that quality of thinking about other stuff than just business, actually, how much that plays a part in business? Because I have a friend of mine who is at the CXO suite of a top company in India, and he keeps complaining that, boss, whenever I go out with my other senior colleagues, there is nothing to talk about. They are not reading books. They are not listening to music. It's Bollywood or cricket or random politics. Yeah. There's simply nothing there. There's no higher order there. And I wonder to what extent the higher order is necessary and to what extent it's a self-indulgence that may get in the way of, uh, you know, clear thinking and instrumental acting. No, I, I, I mean... I can hear Stephen Fry, higher than what, lower than what. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Um, but I, I understand what you're trying to ask, given all the limitations that we have uh, in English. The, I, I think it makes things more clear. And this, this is this is why I, I've... I, I keep making these disclaimers. Even through this this podcast, I keep saying things like, look, it makes sense to me, but I don't know if it makes sense to you. Uh, if I haven't made the disclaimer yet, all of the things I believe in today are likely to change. Uh, my, my favorite thing is to have my mind changed. I, I absolutely love the process when that happens. And so I hope that in, in how many other years uh, you and I speak again next, if we do, many of the things that I believe in today, I, I still don't believe in at that stage, or I've changed my mind, or I have some nuance that I didn't have today, right? The the minute you attempt to learn, to, to dive into this this world of, it's a combination of self-introspection and trying to put the world in order, you get thrown into an abyss. It's, it's absolute pandemonium and chaos. 
And so it takes a few years, a few years of like grappling with this. But soon you come away with with very clear, that person behind your face sort of becomes clearer and clearer and has more reasonable justification for something than a previously held belief and so on and so forth. And that helps a lot in building a good company. Uh, it helps in the people you hire, the policies you write, how you respond to crises. I, I, I think a lot about how there was a 40 million year period in the, in the evolution of, of the earth when there was nothing on earth except grass. Nothing, no trees, very small microorganisms, just grass for 40 million years. Uh, that's an incredibly long amount of time, right? We're probably around for, for, for a couple dozen years. And in learning about that and then, and then reading through philosophy on just significance, uh, it gives me deep appreciation for my process of building a company. Because when something is set on fire and something is about to break, I realize that it's a very small thing. Uh, and this is similar to what people who go trekking feel as well, right? Where the, the further you go from civilization, the more and more you realize that all of these problems are they're really fun. They're very meaningful to solve. They give you short-term purpose and um, you stay from nihilism and all of those 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 beautiful things happen. But it puts into perspective the things that that you are contending with. It makes people very real. So, of course, you could, you could take like a, a very solipsistic first position and say, I don't even know that the other people are, are real. So I know I'm real. I experience that, that. I don't even know if what I'm experiencing is, is true. It could be an illusion. But that I experience is something that I'm not able to, to really break away from. But I have to make that, okay, so I make an assumption. The assumption is you are like me and you, you, you feel the same things I feel. You think the same. You have the internal monologue that I have. And then as a, as a as somebody who's leading a team or a, you're speaking with an ind individual person, you can put into context that that all this is, it's a it's a decrease of maybe 2% in revenue. But this is a real person with a real problem. Uh, very early on, for example, we had a, a holiday policy question and we were looking at other co companies in India and you'd have really bizarre holiday policies. Things like you can only take X number of days off in a year and the reasons that you could take a day off were prescribed in the policy document. Strange things like if a family member died. And I never understood why you couldn't take a day off if a friend died or a dog died. Uh, each person is different and I wouldn't be like to treat I, I wouldn't like to be treated in a way where there is a prescription for why I can and cannot take a holiday. And so we didn't do it. We said these are all real people and so we, we have to be able to to allow for them to, to take days off when they want to. It's a very small example of a policy, uh, internal policy, but all of this is, is pre-described with. And in, in the things that we spoke about earlier, whether or not you bribe somebody, who you're willing to take money from, right? All of these these questions that that you will inevitably face as you're building a company are best answered through through uh, philosophical reading. Okay, so I have a question for you, right? Because we were saying that you and I seem to agree on on lots of things, uh, which I'm sure is true. I think I have my own version to this answer, but mm. I mean, to this question, but I'd love to to pick your brain. We agree that free will does not exist. Lots of the things that we, practically everything that we do does not come from a quote-unquote free place. If you listen to Daniel Dennett talk about this, I think uh, he says that the philosopher types have abstracted this too much. So in the practical day-to-day -day experience of doing things, we do feel free and we do feel like we, we have a conscious choice, even if it is severely influenced by various other things. Then you have the libertarian first position, which is, um, I should be able to contract and consent of my own free will do you feel like these two things are, are contradictory in some way? So firstly, just to clarify, I believe within the free will debate, the term libertarian is used in a very different way from what it is used outside the free will debate. So I, I'm guessing that your question is really about the general all-purpose libertarian way where you value agency and consent and all of that. And your question is, what is the point of agency and consent if you don't have free will anyway? My, my sort of position on free will always has been that, yeah, I don't, see how it is feasible how it is remotely rational to believe that we have free will we obviously don't i'll you know i'll uh, link in the show notes to both sam harris's book on it and uh Robert Sapolsky just has a book on it, a book on it out called Determined. And uh, I've read his previous book, Behave But Not Determined, but it's also about how there is no free will. Right. Now, logically, I don't see how there can be free will. If you know the position of every atom in the universe and how every neuron is firing and whatever, if you had the perfect information, you would know that the next second is determined and the second after that and so on and so forth. Now, of course, we have a lack of knowledge, so we think in probabilistic ways about the world. And also, there have been various books which have shown that our brain has decided what to do before our conscious mind even knows it. And often our conscious mind is only rationalizing why we do what we do. So I don't think there is free will, but I believe that 
we must behave and perhaps we don't have a choice but to behave as if there is free will because where the hell are we going if we say that if we go to a court and say right oh there is no free will so you know it's not his fault that he killed someone and it's not his fault that he embezzled someone and you are getting nowhere with uh, determinism like that so i think we must behave as if there is free will otherwise i mean i don't understand what one is to do i believe in uh, determined uh, sapolsky does talk about the implications on our behavior of yeah. the knowledge that there is no free will i i haven't read determined so i'm looking forward to sort of reading that and continuing the argument but my sort of and maybe it's a cop out but my position really is that uh, we don't have free will but we must behave as if we do and uh, and so on w- w- what's your take on it yeah it's an i mean so first just just to add to what you said you said that if we'd known every position of every atom in the universe so on and so forth but a physicist would look at that and say look the at the quantum level everything is probabilistic uh, it's it's impossible to know and so you cannot you cannot have a computer model unless you you compute it okay but but that, that that's a question really about knowledge of course it is right. unknowable but that doesn't mean it's not determined ha huh, exactly so I, this is what i agree with which is even if it is random it is not in your control right and that so too. yeah the the fact of randomness does not take away from the fact fact of determinism okay fair enough so i wanted to sort of add that that as an aside the no it's been an interesting question on my mind as well um, to to what degree do we do i mean if 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 you believe so strongly in your in in the need to consent and um, so, somebody were to consensually pick up a cigarette and develop a smoking habit and you know grow a cancer and then die of it um, significantly earlier than they would if the state the evil state came in and regulated uh, tobacco and said absolutely no cigarettes for anybody which they, for example do for your cocaine habit um, <laughs> <laughs> then that what? was a joke gentle because <laughs> i don't have a cocaine habit <laughs> Okay I mean I see a table with a lot of white powder <laughs> it could be practically anything but fair enough if he says it's not cocaine it's not cocaine and I'm not partaking I promise the I mean I can see how somebody could use your belief our belief in in the fact that it looks like there is no free will to to push very anti libertarian first positions and say that they have no choice in making these horrible decisions and we have to step in as the state and prevent them from from doing all of these things which it's just been part of my recent reading and i've been quite interested in in sort of those ways of arguing these things um i know a lot of this is is fairly abstracted and and in the sky uh, but I, but i enjoy them i enjoy these thought experiments uh, there's one that i recently heard of which is which is which takes on utilitarianism as a as an idea and it says something like if if you were to uh, you had two choices it's a thought experiment of course it's not real where one you could kill somebody and live the rest of your life thinking that you didn't or two you could not kill this person but live the rest of your life thinking that you did hmm. which of the two would you pick and it's an example that i thought was very good at at uh, dismantling the utilitarian approach because most people on that side of the spectrum would say something like we shouldn't kill people like that's that's under the category of bad in what a moral landscape they have but it will make you feel horrible forever and if if what you're optimizing for is your ability not to feel this deep and intense guilt for the rest of your life then you would in fact kill the person and live your life in the knowledge that you had in them that you'd save their life in fact whether it can practically manifest in the real world i don't think so but still still fairly interesting so yeah all of this is is slightly an abstract study and then we still have to figure out ways to bring that into the world you and i live in no i love that bit about i love the thought experiment you just posed and i think the added nuance to that is that a utilitarian might choose the option where they haven't killed someone but live the rest of their lives believing that they do mm-hmm. but the belief that they have killed someone could actually change the person that they are and make them more likely to kill someone in the future because hey they've already done it because they will then they might then to get away from the guilt find a way to rationalize the killing that they have done and therefore you know that strips them of that veneer that uh, kind of uh, helps them think of themselves as good people who do not kill and my issue with i can i can see how the state could use the logic of no free will to intervene in an individual case that okay deepak is going to harm himself the state will step in and it will you know stop him and he has no free will so the state has to do it but once you given to the principle that the state can intervene then that uh, then you must assume that that pr- power that you have given to the state will be used by the worst people imaginable in the worst ways possible all of which is perhaps inevitable but it it is also i think important for us to of fight course. it and behave as if we actually are fighting it of course yeah you know that the two of us agree on on lots of these things yeah. um i'm simply positing that there that in in reading these more abstract sort of discussions and discourses these are quite interesting and 
I really enjoy these. I quite enjoy because anything that's contrarian looks a little bit weird or wonky, and then suddenly has some underpinnings to it. Where somebody says something completely outrageous, and I say that's crazy. How could that be true? Um, or how could you even possibly justify that it is true? And then they they use th- these weird tricks and tips, uh, weird tricks to be able to 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 put that argument together. I love the process, and I love being able to do it myself if I could. So here's a thought experiment for you, mm-hmm. right? An aliens uh, an alien civilization has invaded the planet. They are far more powerful. Than us on day one they destroy New York on day two they destroy Paris on day three they look at Delhi and they say fuck it they're destroying themselves and they go destroy Sydney instead and uh, then the planet obviously then gets together and they're like uh, you know they send their representative hopefully not with orange hair up to mm-hmm. talk to the aliens and the aliens say okay we'll make a deal here's a deal on our planet uh, we don't have oxygen our oxygen is basically pain mm-hmm. so pain is what keeps us going. so rather than cause large amounts of pain at a go like blowing up cities and all which is fun we like explosions but what we'll do is we'll harvest your pain in a very small way we we'll let all of you live and we'll let all of you proceed as if nothing happened but once a month you have to pick an 8 year old boy a 8 year old child and send that child to us and we will torture the child in unspeakable ways and and eventually of course the kid will die but only after a month of pain when we move on to the next kid So as a planet you know what do you choose to do do you, do you choose to and uh, rejecting the offer means certain annihilation accepting the offer means you choose an 8 year old every uh, month so what do you do I love it have you read the ones who walk away from omelas someone recommended the book to me once but it's a short yeah. it's like a five page story uh-huh. so i will tell you the story because it is practically the same question mm-hmm. um, and i love these fables i absolutely enjoy when when people present these in 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 abstract stories uh, there is in this in this story a town that is in a state of uh, absolute uh, utopia everybody is happy they have all the resources that they want and it's not the it's not the sort of boring happiness that that you would think of they're happy in a way where they also have these little challenges that come along that make them happier but there's something to put their mind to they feel well utilized through the entire day the 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 sort of utopian space where for for most humans or for all humans and that's that, that civilization they live a great life they would change nothing about their day and time and the author goes almost two three pages in intricate detail on exactly why this this city is, is so wonderful to live in and he says but there's a catch in a bunk or a cellar in some basement under the under the uh, city there is a child who is in a small room it's like a broom room so a few feet a few feet wide and this child is in the most deplorable of states and the child must stay there if the child leaves the city falls apart and every once in a while uh, people come to visit the child you can there is there is no nothing preventing you from coming to visit the child uh, so you can walk down and you can peer through the window and see the child extremely malnourished smaller than it should be practically no food in a genuine state of suffering but the child does not know any better does not know that it suffers it just knows this one existence many people choose not to go they choose not to look at the child but some do and they go and look at the child and of those few who do there are some who can't stop thinking about it and so it could happen a day later a week later a month later but they wake up one morning and they walk away they leave the city they go south or north or east they don't know where they're going but they can no longer stay in that utopian space and uh, they head for the forests they head for the mountains no one knows where they go and these are the ones who leave omelas and the question is would you leave if you were one of the one of the people and you you went down would you go down at all would you look through Uh, the window would you see the child if you did would you continue to think about it and if you did would you leave that's the that's the question and i think it's it's similar to this which is it's similar i mean my uh, short answer to that is that i am in omelas but there is no way to go i want to leave but there is no mm. way to go but anyway and i can't help the kid yes uh, but would you fix omelas such that the child is liberated but all of us collective species falls down some some number of percentage points in well being and if it was up to me of course if it mm-hmm. was up to me it's not like like mohit told you it's not even a choice <laughs> if you yeah. can you must but to go back to the one Your i threw at you yeah, yeah. Uh, i think my my answer is similar which is but but okay um th- this is the challenge with with well being as the center of your argument which is you have to pick between and you, you how do you compare how many lives to how many lives how many people to how many people i think it's a thought experiment for a reason there isn't a clear answer um, i i mean I, to, I, yeah. um, to, to to simplify it for listeners aware that i think about the question that i posed mm-hmm. is that it's really a classic example of 
a utilitarian framework and a deontological framework and a deontological framework is you come from first principles so your first principle might be that consent is paramount or you can't hurt anyone and etc etc it could be yes. a, a, any first principle whatsoever and a utilitarian framework is greatest good for the greatest number to put it really simply there are many variations to that so a utilitarian would straight away say yeah yeah of course the 8 year old uh, someone like me has trouble reconciling to that but even if i say that fine the 8 year old is maybe going to go anyway if the whole species goes yes. so you decide to do it my question is supposing i keep upping the number it's not one 8 year old a month it's 10 8 year olds every day yeah. or it's x people at what number this is the trolley problem in another way yeah i, I or a type of trolley problem i also think that the answer that we arrive at in in this room speaking into microphones that are pop probably going to be listened to by hundreds of people thousands of people your millions and millions of followers mm -hmm. uh, is different than what i would probably do in the circumstance when handed in that particular if i was really there i, I cannot say for certain that whatever answer i articulate now is what i will do in the, in that space and time i'd like to think that i'd stick to my first principles it's how i've i've sort of governed myself up until now but no no situation has been as dire and drastic and it's it's I'm happy to hope and think that that that's who I would be, and that I would say, "Look, no one is sacrificed. Take us all if you must," including the child who would have died, who would, be, who would be dying anyway. This is also the fable of the the dragon tyrant, which you yeah. spoke to Vitalik about, which is which was asks a similar question, except he's trying to okay solve death. Yeah. So, but you you've struck at the heart of it. You've struck at the heart of how it's so hard to arrive at at moral first positions, and everything we do is built on top of that. The way we relate with ourselves, our peers. the the people around us family and how the state relates with us what we allow the state to do to us all of those things rest on first principles that we have and maybe my current thinking is it's not so important to prescribe answers and it's not easy to because millions of years have passed and we've not really been able to come to to great answers it is important to keep asking the questions lots of people do not go down the rabbit hole they don't end up here and say hey i really don't know what the answer is that's really hard and even being able to get there i think impacts policy all the way up. because then you can you can start saying things like yeah you know you're doing this but your justification is not solid it's grounded on something subjective can we talk about that can we try and rip it apart right so even getting this far is is a good start for me i hope over the next few years i'm able to get further but this is as far as i've i've gotten right now here's another thought experiment mm -hmm. uh, question for you and i'm beginning to think if we'll have a different answer here maybe this is where we find difference mm -hmm. but i i wrote a newsletter post where i mentioned this experiment as well supposing you are stranded on a desert island with one more person you know you will be rescued at some point but you haven't been rescued yet and food has run out mm -hmm. and now the only way for you to stay alive is to kill and eat the other person what would you do um killing it the other person my first principle for self preservation in my own life supersedes my my principle on the other person's consent so here's the thing supposing the other person is me mm -hmm. and we know by now that you and i agree on everything mm -hmm. and therefore you know that i am also going to think along these lines and kill and eat you as soon as the food runs out it therefore becomes optimal for me to kill and eat you before you kill and eat me yes. and it makes it optimal for you to preempt that and it makes it optimal for me to preempt that preemption so basically the game theoretically or optimal solution the course of action is the moment we are on that island long before the food runs out <laughs> we have to have a fight to the death is that what is going to happen that's that's i mean again interesting but not practical it's not what will happen because um, human nature has other right but also we we won't really so on on the game theory front right i was listening to okay so, so there's someone recently talk about why we hold so many nuclear weapons we have tens of thousands of them and we don't need so many to blow the other person up um and through the cold war for example the the states had tens of thousands um as as did the the soviet union and the answer is game theory which is Um, I and if you ask them individually they'll say something like I really don't want to have to deal with the overhead of so many nukes they're on my property they could kill my people it's almost certain destruction but I have to I have no choice in the matter right the other the other person and then and then vice versa I I think it's it's similar to what you're asking which is do we start holding the nukes today itself or and i think at in the early stage of being on the island we'll spend some time attempting to figure out if there are other ways to do it we will believe that there is some some ingenuity within us that could drive towards a better solution than consuming the other person we may even speak about it i have a conversation saying hey listen we've done the math you are like me and i am like you and we we know that we're, we're likely to um to consume each other so how about we we sort of handle it in this particular way and it could be that i give you my arm and you give me yours or we or each eat our own arm i think i prefer eating my own arm than yours all the yours is fleshier than mine is, so i will right, i will yeah. probably optimize for that um the disadvantages of not being on keto <laughs> right <laughs> but um 
and, and this is what I'm hopeful about. Um, I, while you can build the hypothetical, and it's really fun and interesting, and I mean, we, we could have dozens go back and forth. There are these very beautiful middle grounds, which is, you know, knowing that we're going to game theorize our way out of this, and that could lead to terrible circumstances. How do we use human wisdom and intuition to to try and negate that and figure out better paths to to, to getting out of this? Um, and that, that's why I said before that if anything, the the place that I would love to get to is a place where I'm questioning these things very deeply. Because even getting there is a start on being able to get to an answer if that exists at all. So let's let's go back to the startup ecosystem. And like when I say startup ecosystem, I mean ecosystem. A part of the ecosystem is also incubators. You had an early experience with them. You gave a very powerful presentation on what often goes wrong with many of the incubators that you have seen. And I guess you can contrast it with the Y Combinator. So so a lot of lessons in there. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. The first question to ask is what is an incubator? We've done about half a dozen incubator programs to date. University incubators, state-run incubators, corporate incubators. and the reason I did that presentation, so uh, in fact, Shruti had, had reached out saying, is there something that you've been ranting about for the longest time? And I said, yeah, how India's incubators are broken. And she said, okay, let's then try and put together a presentation. Is because there is a definition mismatch between what founders think and expect an incubator is and what incubation administrators in India think an incubator is. So if I can recall from memory, the first page of the Technology Business Incubator, TBI, which is a state-run incubation uh, scheme. Uh, the first page of the policy document reads, Business Incubation has been globally recognized as an important tool for job creation and economic development. The first objective, objective of a TBI is to create jobs, wealth, and improve the economy in alignment with national priorities. Oh, wow. The phase product market fit appears zero times in any scheme document anywhere. Uh, what do founders think an incubator is or should do? We think that an incubator gets us from idea to product market fit a lot faster than we would ourselves without the incubator. And that's such a simple and intuitive idea, right? Which is, if you remember from, from earlier, I mentioned that you could broadly divide a startup journey into idea, then product market fit, then you replicate and scale. So finding product market fit is sort of what unlocks a lot of future, a lot of the future suddenly the future is not hazy anymore, it's set in stone. Because if I know what I'm building is needed by users, then I can raise capital, I can hire employees, I can make future bets, I can invest today, I can do all those things because I know that there is a future and I can approximately chart it out. I can't do that before product market fit. And so the acceleration of that journey is incredibly valuable. If somebody is able to get me there, if I, if I would by myself, for example, take a year and you can get me there in three months, I'm willing to give you 5% of my company because that that's so incredibly valuable to me. Okay. So that's the definition of what an incubator should be. In the Indian space, the way an incubator typically presents is a room in a university or a room in a corporate office, um, which is strange because nothing about what I said, idea to product market fit requires a room, right? Or that it be in a, in a university or a corporate office. And th this is this is partly because the mindset around building these incubators is that we don't have entrepreneurial and an entrepreneurial bent of mind as a country for whatever reasons there are some students who may who may be able to take that course they simply need to be coached into it Th this is that presumption and so a university will start an incubator they may uh, receive grants from the state to build that incubator and then bring in students and broadly, what I'm talking about is is very valid for young entrepreneurs. I was mentioning to you earlier that I recently found out that I'm older than something like 60-70% of India's population. The great entrepreneurs of our lifetimes are still in school and college. And this is the experience that they will go through, right? Which is they will go to college and it it will, it will present as a, as a room in, in that classroom, in, in that university or in, in a nearby corporate office. And it is typically staffed with people who who are not entrepreneurs themselves. These are corporate employees or academic professors. And it is it is this nature of the incubator that's problematic. So in a bunch of ways. Um, the first, incubators don't give you guaranteed capital. This is so bizarre to me. Because if you believe in an entrepreneur and you believe in what they're building, why would you not give them money? 99% uh, of India's incubators offer no guaranteed capital. Right? So, so what do they do instead? They either offer selective capital, which is I may finance you if I, if I so choose to, or two, I will connect you to somebody who can finance you. Right? That's sort of the... the and they process. take a percentage for that. If, worse, sometimes they ask you to ask you to pay to be incubated. There are oh. incubators in India where you have to pay them. 
this is i think the start of the breakage uh, you need to put your money where your mouth is if you believe in an entrepreneur you need to give them money advice without capital is not useful advice but young entrepreneurs don't know this if you think about the average 17 18 year old who's just finished this whole iit nit you know triad gets into engineering school or could be other types of schools um, other curriculums there is uh, two existing sort of pillars the first is you have the sir culture which is whenever somebody comes to you say yes sir yes sir okay sir i'll do this i'll do that or yes ma'am i'll do this and second you have the assumption that 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 authority whatever they say is true and right right and so when when they don't give you money but they give you advice it's not like you respond saying you haven't given me money so i'm not going to do what you what you're saying and often times the, the person giving you advice in a academic incubator is your professor it's the person who also grades your papers and things like that so you can't even say no if you wanted to right and this is what we went through as well they're very well meaning this there's there's no there is no they're not being malicious in their advice it's just they don't know any better right all the unintuitive unintuitive things we spoke about don't present okay that's problem number 1 there's no guaranteed capital it's selective problem number 2 all of this money is doled out as grants and not as capital against equity this is a problem as well because the people giving out the grants are not entrepreneurs themselves they don't really understand deeply how our businesses are built or how the landscape is set up and they tend to finance those companies that seem the most academically exciting or will get them a phd paper or make them look better in their own organization the most exciting idea which is why you see headlines like iit madras children building you know f- flying flying restaurant right something totally bizarre which you you look at and say this is so crazy who wants to go to a flying restaurant but it doesn't matter what's happened internally in the organization is that the student has has thought up of the idea and again typically what happens with engineers at least is that we build before we sell so we have no evidence that the, that the market really wants it we just think it's a cool thing to build and th- that's that's the sort of experience we're going after then you take it to a professor and the professor says wow this is a great idea i'd love to write about this put it in a paper whatever the professor will give you a grant that comes out of the state budget i think the startup india uh, seed fund is 1200 crores over 4 years so it's quite a bit of money so you'll get like a 15 lakh rupee grant then you sit and build a prototype that cannot be scaled that nobody wants nothing at all your dean sees it and says wow this is cool let me call times of india or some some you know local press they come down and do a full photo uh, you know photo op you have a, 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 an article published and then this this goes into your resume some company sees it and wow this is a this is a great innovative employee and you get hired and and you work as an employee for the rest of your life it does exactly the opposite of what you intend for it to do and all the entrepreneurs who want to build well meaning businesses that sound boring but solve real problems never get into these incubators in the first place okay uh, so that's problem number 2 it's all doled out as grants it should be capital against equity now you of course i can hear the question forming in your brain which is why would the state own equity in your company that is even more dystopian than than what the current circumstances um i agree B- but we live in a country unfortunately where the state does a lot of incubation this negatively impacts a lot of the early stage incubation spaces because lots of private interests who want to get into the early stage space simply don't because the state has already pumped so much money and it's it's a skewed market okay problem number 3 the terms are uh, are opaque so we did the we did the counting of this in august last year only state run incubators that's tbis i think something like 20% of them don't have a working website the website doesn't load so forget everything else forget the quality of incubation yada yada the the website it's itself does not load but the number of websites across incubators corporate private all of them put together that have an agreement on the website that you can read which is the agreement that that you are expected to sign if you do get into the in, into the incubator um, is something like 3 or 4 incubators in the entire country that have a, a, an agreement on their website um, and this process is super opaque so as a student you you apply with an idea or a young entrepreneur you apply with an idea they say okay this is interesting but i won't give you money so come and sit in my classroom and you spend hours you know in the classroom listening to to whatever it is that they're saying because they think that entrepreneurship can be taught then you have to listen to what they say in order to unlock the future capital because not everybody in that room is going to get money mm. in every incubator some small subset of people will get the money and the insight here is lots of founders are building companies that their incubators want not the companies that their users want which is horrible it's the exact opposite of what entrepreneurship should be then they may select you as one of the the people to get the money and then they present you with the terms and this is often a 21 page long legal agreement that has all sorts of terms you never heard or heard about before you don't have your own own lawyer and there's a sunk cost i'm already so many months in and you're bit between the devil and a hard place and you have to pick one of the two and usually you just sign whatever it is that they give you and those are horrible terms this is evil 
by whatever definition I, i'm sort of basing this 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 moral exposition it is evil that incubators do this to to young founders and many get lost along the way and, and never start up it's billions of dollars of or rupees of money for for, for the country in general uh, that's lost because of this and then finally uh, it breaks good hearts law in lots of ways so good hearts law is when a measure becomes a target it ceases to be a good measure the way we used to measure inventiveness as a country was we'd look at the number of patents being filed was a great idea you could look at how inventive the country was going being now top down this is the metric that you are supposed to hit so today incubators bias for those entrepreneurs who can file a patent and even if you can't they will force you to file one you spend the first 3 or 4 months of your incubation writing a patent document uh, which is bizarre because some products don't suffer from defensibility there is no reason to employ the power of the state to de- to defend you know your hardware design or whatever it is but the incubator has no choice they have to send reports monthly annually to the state to there, there are, I mean, you can read the scheme documents but there are centrally governing agencies and these are registered you have to register your incubator today and so invariably i'm going to force my entrepreneurs to the same thing with mentorship as well number of hours of mentorship is tracked by the state there's a leaderboard of who does better and who does worse and so invariably i'm going to force entrepreneurs to sit in classrooms and teach them from mba textbooks things that have no relevance to the ability to build a company but that help me tick off the box uh, in my report back upstairs um, so this is sort of broadly what the problem is in in indian incubation and i think a good incubator is one that is super selective so takes very few companies that they really believe in gives them money at the outset gives them money at transparent terms the terms are downloadable from the web, the website and something simple like a safe right or a, a, some convertible simple instrument and then stays out of your business where they say look i've, I've there, there is no advice unless asked for and once i've given you money i'm not going to give you shit advice or guess work advice i'm going to likely reach out to somebody who is in a similar space do the hard work of connecting you so like i said no no ma- no no mal intention here nobody is attempting to to ruin the ecosystem it's all well intentioned but the road to hell is paved with good intentions first of all i'm just kind of blown away that i i had no idea that the state puts money taxpayers money into incubators and startups and all that that is simply not the business of the state and i can't imagine anything successful coming out of it either what was your experience in the incubator that you were part of that was not a state incubator right that was uh, we've, we've done six so i've done corporate i've done academic i've done state wow. as well yeah right. and this also extends to competitions by the way the state runs lots of startup competitions and other people do as well and all of it is rubbish it's it's um, it's problematic because it provides incorrect signal to startups when a startup can win a competition they're usually able to wow the judges who are these judges is officers bu- people in in the bureaucracy and even if it is an entrepreneur it's likely somebody who's pre tech which is they're in a manufacturing business right they not really they don't know what an api is for example so to be able to to wow them is not relevant product market fit is proven from with your users when people are willing to pay for what you're selling and they're willing to pay you even more if you want to up, up the price then you know that i have something worth selling right so it, okay this my criticism of incubators extends certainly to startup competitions as well uh, and entrepreneurs wait waste unknowingly lots of time on this where they announce so proudly that hey i won like three startup competitions but it doesn't mean anything Uh, until you find product market fit and build a real business it's just a distraction along the way and yes this the state does does finance incubators so our experience was something like this when we did our did the corporate incubators it was very apparent that the corporate incubators exist squarely for their for the enrichment of the corporate and it will usually present as the seeking of vendors so they will say that you can be incubated with me and the end result of this incubation is that you and i can collaborate on something so let's say that it's a, an automobile company who's doing who's who's joined an incubator and sort of running the incubator the reason they're putting money into this and their employees on this is because they're looking for new innovations in let's that say in, in that space so you create a new kind of dash cam then they will say okay fine no, we, we will work together it's that, that's what you can seek to win so if you're an entrepreneur and that company is likely the best buyer for your product then go ahead and get incubated be very selfish about this but otherwise don't go because they don't really care about you and be wary that th- that purchase order will present in 2 years or 3 years the hierarchy of corporates is only second to that of the state it's quite slow moving and they have no incentives it's all small money to them in contrast to their primary business that they're already running day in and day out so th- broadly that's my experience with corporates and the employees who are giving you advice it's usually somebody who's like a vp or senior vp whatever are genuinely smart people they've just never built a business and all the unintuitive things about starting up that that every entrepreneur who goes through the journey will come to realize they have not realized those things and they will not be able to impart that wisdom to you which means you and them completely well meaning will go down rabbit holes that are intuitive and you will waste time 
right so don't take advice second academic incubators academic incubators like i said is is effectively a proxy for writing more papers these are professors who want to publish more and they will use the the funds to to you know uh, help entrepreneurs and the few that get through and still build a big business are doing it because they would have done it anyway they're not doing it because right this, this is not causal and third uh, state run state run is how you think all state state enterprises work so to give you an example in the early days we tried to put a bike share on on the streets of nasik because we were working on the nasik smart city the smart city mission had just been announced if you remember 2014 15 is when after the bjp came into power and they had quite a bit of money in the bank and so we went to them and said hey a smart city should consist of a shared bike and we were still doing mobility at the point so can we explore this and immediately it was apparent that all they care about is the photo op the the photo op and the article in the newspaper is sort of what drives all of this there's a lot of you know kal commissioner sir aayenge so tomorrow the commissioner will come so please make sure that that you're we're ready for the commissioner you should so on and so forth this is a i mean they are entrenched in their own interests and rightly so fair enough you you're climbing the bureaucratic ladder but this is not particularly valuable to entrepreneurs uh, we decided to, to step away and say okay we're not doing the public bike share simply because this is one of those factors that we don't think is conducive for us and more entrepreneurs should probably do that but state run incubators have the interest of the state in mind and again to to remind you about what the incubation scheme document said the incubation is, is so that they can grow uh, the economy grow jobs right in the national interest right and what this reminds me of is if you read the last lecture randy, randy posh. posh correct yeah I, I, i was trying to remember his name he talks about the head fake right look right go left and he says if you want your child to learn teamwork you don't send your child to teamwork classes you send them to football classes they never become a great footballer but they learn teamwork along the way mm. and the way to solve for those things if you are the state economy the jobs if you care deeply about that and, and of course i mean i'm going to assume well intentioned you do care about that the way to do it is to allow entrepreneurs to get to product market fit fast and build great businesses and if they do that invariably along the way all the other problems that you're trying to solve will be solved these are effects of of a of a good a good market these are these, these are these are not the ends that ought to be pursued uh, and in the pursuit of those ends you end up missing the market entirely which i think is what's happening over here is there like a crowding out effect where because these moribund incubators with completely the wrong incentives take up so much space within the ecosystem that a you're losing a lot of startups who are you know being misdirected early on because they're going down these uh, particular paths and uh, see there aren't more private incubators or more you know uh, I, i mean where is india's yc for example yes so is, is there a crowding out effect also in place yes to all of that i i mean i can't say this because i haven't looked at the data i'm sure that it perhaps exists empirically but we don't really invite a lot of global participation so incubators who have figured out uh, how to do this well and profitably abroad don't really present in india they present in other geographies but not really in india um, i can't say exactly why but i presume there is some re- something regulatory here that that is that is preventing that from happening but again i have to compete with the state so i'm i'm probably not going to do that as quickly and i'm so uh, all of this is is being said from the perspective of me being a founder and me falling in love with other founders and their journeys it, it's the most exciting thing and you would know right you've started your own the podcast is a business um, it's such a wonderful process to 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 go from something that's just in my head all the way to an enterprise that works and delivers value for other people and it's it's so heartbreaking to watch the disillusionment that they end up facing in two or three and some of these incubators the incubation period is like two years three years there are entrepreneurs who join and never leave they're just st- you know sitting in those rooms day in and day out and they effectively become subservient to the people who run those incubators uh, is is genuinely heartbreaking to watch like i said earlier and this this is how i started off the presentation as well i think that billions of dollars and thousands of entrepreneurs have been lost to bad incubation and i care deeply about this i'd like to fix it if anyone listening also cares about fixing it please write to me i'm at deepak@tilt.bike and and we can try and, and figure out something but b- the 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 question i'm asking now is for young entrepreneurs who are just starting out how do we redirect them uh, to those incubators that are valuable or in my opinion the better route skip incubators entirely and instead look for good angel investors because india has lots of wealthy individuals who are willing to put a few lakh rupees a few dozen lakh rupees into smart entrepreneurs and those are probably better ways to go about this than to join your college incubator which is invariably what is happening unfortunately today Let's dig a little deep into you know what advice you would give young entrepreneurs. One is of course this: that fine, watch out for incubators yeah. like this, and you know don't go there. But apart from that, what are the lessons you've learned during your journey that can kind of help them? Like, what are the 
intuitive beliefs that are wrong and what are the unintuitive beliefs that extend not just you know for your industry which you earlier spoke about but which extend across the, the startup space mm. i think first the there is no there is no value to short term thinking it's what we default to it's the monkey brain in us that says think for immediate benefit something as simple as let's say you're building product x and a customer comes along and says look i'll give you some amount of money and you're zero revenue at this stage right you've never tasted tasted revenue and says but you have to pivot your business in a way that is a consult- consultancy to me right so i want like five unique features that are you know an overhead for you for the rest of your your lifetime it's very easy to default to saying yeah okay i'll do it right unless of course those features are genuinely meaningful for your entire user base in which case please build it but if it's not and you know that this is a one off case and this person's just being a bully because you're a young founder lots of founders or a first time founder i won't even use the word young lots of founders do it they default to doing it and i don't think it's a good idea it's okay to to be a little bit gritty and it's okay to say that yeah uh, all i'm losing is money uh, but but it, it will all pay off this is the the the, the matrix that says that we the, 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 there is some short term sacrifice but there is long term game long term gain and to believe in, to believe in that is is i think a a good way to behave this startup journey also is is so difficult on you as an individual there will be many nights when you will be unable to fall asleep simply because you don't know how you'll make next payroll or where the company is heading or if it's heading anywhere at all you would have spoken to some some vc who says uh, you know your market is too small or nobody will ever want your product um, and that that will weigh heavily on your mind because for them it's a one hour call but for you it is your life's or your currently your life's mission and this is where i think two things help the first philosophy where it's it's okay it's okay to fail and you should make a peace with that in fact it's likely that you will fail that is the startup journey and that you you can what we spoke about a 40 million year period where we had nothing but grass it's it's not as uh, it's not as life and death uh, if you think about yourself from the future let's say you are 60 years old if you get that far and you were to ask yourself for advice i'm sure that that person would not say hey don't sleep tonight and sit and worry about this problem they'd say you know what it, it works out in the long run it's all fine um you're just building a company at the end of the day right so make sure you have fun doing it and and you you have a um you 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 respect all those first principles that you've put in place and, and use that to execute second surround yourself with all the right people it's hard to find them uh, start with co-founders i don't know how I, i would have built this if i didn't have co-founders so it's it's excessively lonely otherwise um and there are some days when you simply don't feel like building your business because you you wake up and it's too hard or everything's on fire or you just don't have any space left in your brain right but your co-founders will not feel that way on that day and so they will lift you up and they will build instead of you and they'll give you a little bit of time to to, rec- to recoup and you will do that in return for them so finding very good co-founders is, we know this empirically all the data points towards this that Uh, is is uh, uh, a remedy for success and then mentors as well so f- find people who believe in you are ethical uh, willing to guide you on your journey so on and so forth it's not easy but as l- if you're thinking about this as a multiple decades mission then i think all of these priorities will set in place and, and start paying dividends in the long run Uh, my mind just went back to incubators and i thought that if there was a podcast incubator i'd be screwed because no uh, podcast incubator would ever agree to a podcast more than half an hour mm-hmm. they would talk of short attention spans they would insist on getting a particular kind of guest who can get who can supposedly get particular kinds of eyeballs and i never get out of that mess and the worst would be if i believed it myself which i did in the start mm. but then you keep experimenting and you keep trying new things and you change but you know a constrained environment like that of an incubator doesn't allow that i'm also thinking of the long game right now when i was a professional poker player you are always playing the hands that you are dealt and if they are shitty they are shitty you just take the most plus ev approach possible which is often folding and that's just the way it is but what saves you is that you can put in volume in the sense you if i'm a poker player i you know at one time online i used to play 8 10 tables at a time you can multi table so your sample size is enormous you're dealt a lot of hands mm-hmm. in life you really aren't dealt so many hands you know the opportunity cost for any course of action whether it is quitting or whether it is continuing can be really hard and i think about that sometimes because there is always this cliched advice that is given to people that follow your heart follow your dream and you'll obviously have the selection bias of seeing the people who made it after following their heart and following their dream but what you don't see is uh, thousands of dreams that were shattered the millions of hearts that were broken you know the like i like to say the cafes of versova are mm. full of middle aged men whose film careers vanished on them right and and now they are doing different jugaru things to survive and 
and and how do you deal with self doubt hitting and sometimes do you think that like if there are a million parallel universes where your life has gone in different directions in all the parallel universes in which you are an entrepreneur you are probably tackling different problems you're not necessarily tackling the same problem this comes from the happenstance of being on a university where there is a campus like that and you are using cycles and the thought uh, so if if it wasn't this particular problem that you were addressing what are the other kind of problems that would attract you for example do you sometimes like i'm sure you keep getting ideas but you are doing this you're very to yeah. this so you continue with tilt and inshallah it seems to be doing well but what are the other kind of problems that attract you as a natural course of things like what was the last startup idea you had i think on a on a weekly basis rachid dakshan i discuss one new idea they're usually terrible but it's it's really fun to go down the rabbit hole of of how we would build it if we ought to build it it's inevitable and especially once you start up then you start seeing problems everywhere because you found a really unique problem and that that cements in you the belief that if i found one there ought to be many and then you keep looking for them and you keep finding them um, i think the last one that we debated was to build a a crm to fundraise so entrepreneurs today fundraise on uh, excel sheets i fundraise on an excel sheet why combinator formally recommends an excel sheet format to fundraise an excel sheet is a terrible way to fundraise because i can't really follow up with people there's no like simple click and go to their linkedin profile uh, i can't know if i'm talking to the wrong person with the advent of ai i am sure that an ai assistant would help me quite a bit for example saying things like slide 4 could be improved in this way or you are talking to to investors from this geography who seem to have a higher proclivity to investing in you uh, so focus your efforts on that and here's a list of 10 of the top investors from there who will invest right? and so on and so forth so a crm to help founders fundraise uh, i thought the idea was was super interesting because i love founders i really enjoy engaging with them day in and day out and listening to all their ideas so i really enjoy doing sales on an idea like this and dak shachit they have a great time building the entire product and so on and so forth and so skill sets also match in terms of an idea like this I, it's it's quite easy actually to come up with these ideas i it's execution that's really hard would something like this as a side project and attempt you um i don't um, like if it's just building an app for example you know yeah nothing is just building an app mm-hmm. all of it is so complex i mean you have to build the initial mvp and then launch and then let's say your users don't like something you have to change it you have to ab test look at all the data uh, none of it is a side project i mean how you do some things so if if you do it you have to do it really well and they have to love your product instinctively and so on and so forth no but uh, there's also the unseen which is i've i've been i mean i've articulated to you very beautifully why this idea idea will work and i'm sure you fall in love with it so you're an investor i'm sure i could uh, if you were an investor i could you know convince you into putting a little bit of money into this but practically as an entrepreneur i'm sure that there are so many unseen difficulties all the things i haven't thought of yet that will emerge on that journey right and none of this is going to um, entice me to to dropping tilt and start start yeah. off on a, on a whole new business but yeah we, we think about new ideas all the time but personally i think that if i so i stumbled into entrepreneurship i did not even know what a private limited company was and we we sort of ended up building one i will certainly like to solve problems off late i'm more interested in these sorts of problems things around philosophy uh, policy relationships between individual people people in the state so on and so forth those interest me quite a bit that that i feel like i have a bias to action bias to do exactly what i'm not sure but some of these problems are so large and impact so many people that small improvements like a 5 10% improvement is millions of people doing significantly like better for example we've the, the incubator problem is a good example right now i know the problem exists it's not spoken about frequently in fact i've never heard somebody on a public platform talk about this Um, and that's because all of the people doing policy or the successful entrepreneurs of our generation didn't go through them it's a fairly recent phenomenon and so fixing india's incubators is a very meaningful thing to do i think that falls more in line with like a side project right because it's easier to do and it's only a few hours of work uh, that sort of thing yeah so th- that's an example and and impacting it even by 10 15 if 10% of of entrepreneurs are deviated away from the wrong sorts of incubators and instead build a company in a way that doesn't involve them uh, losing time on those enterprises that is a, a a genuine and tangible difference to the economy and to themselves as individuals and so that's an example 
and how do you think of exit like there will be entrepreneurs who will just say that i want to solve this problem like angad with clean air yes that i want india to have clean air and period and i'll do what it takes and i'll play the long game and there will be entrepreneurs who will think ki yaar 2 saal banayenge google ko bech denge 10 million le lenge hum khush ho jayenge and equally there could be entrepreneurs who want to build a big public company and are just open to going wherever it goes so what was your uh, sort of vision for where you want to go with this was it aligned with uh, rachit and daksh what were the kind of motivations with that regard like do you think of exit or do you think of just doing this for the rest of your life what is the mindset there we are surprised we got this far the odds are certainly against us startups by this stage have already failed right so to be able to even raise a few rounds in capital is already hard enough uh, if you told me when when i was 18 19 and starting till then it was called pedal that we we would get this far it's like you're kidding me i remember my my f- the first time we crossed 3000 rupees in revenue in a month i told my dad about it uh, on a call and he tells me later many years later that i was very concerned because you were celebrating 3000 rupees in revenue and i cut the call and i spoke to mom and said this is crazy he thinks that this is this is success of some sort uh, because it's such small amounts of money and for every zero added to that number uh, we've always looked at it and said wow i can't believe we got this far right and even where i'm sitting today i, I look at for, for example our graphs and say i have no idea how i'll quadruple this or 10x this because there are so many challenges that only i know about because i'm on my daily calls and i'm talking to my team and i know all of the things that are on fire but now i have conviction that it it can certainly happen because it has happened m- multiple times before in my own journey that it it will continue to happen going forward we don't think about exit per se i think and i don't think entrepreneurs should the way they should think about it is to to be able to create those double thank you moments a double thank you moment is certainly not restricted to a coffee shop it is it is also as large as two corporates working with one another that i i provide meaningful value to you and you to me and we have a double thank you in that and even more valuably our our users have a double thank you in that they say wow i'm so glad that you all collaborated right so that's probably the the route that most entrepreneurs find themselves on when they invariably exit which is you know you buy me or i buy you but we've spent enough time collaborating that these products make a lot of sense together or these services make a lot of sense together and if if those collaborations don't really reach that sort of a space then you end up going public and i don't know if if we want to do that uh, i don't know if we'll get that far even we, we never consider that very deeply but i don't think these are worrying questions the worrying question is is my is are my riders happy with riding tilt what what does their feedback say how are our numbers looking right i think we want to be st- st- stay fairly myopic in in those respects and then in the long run are we bringing cycling to more and more people because that that seems to be what we've agreed that we want to do and if those two things are happening well then we keep doing it yeah so from the satisfaction of your riders let's kind of move back to the personal domain what i have started doing this year and i feel like it's working for me is i have built something called a satisfaction index mm-hmm. the idea behind that is that every day at the end of the day i'll decide how satisfying a day i had and i'll rank it out of 10 and purely based on my uh, sub- subjective feeling of satisfaction though obviously every day that i have a seen unseen recording or an everything is everything recording or even put up a newsletter is straight away 10 on 10 but i can't get more and that's one way of looking at it now one of my friends sudhir sarnobad got taken in by this and he started an excel sheet and he has a bunch of parameters for himself so he's created 12 parameters for himself and he says and his gig is if he does any one of those things he'll give himself two points but the maximum is 10 so he doesn't get 24 and three of them are fitness parameters so if mm-hmm. he misses any of them he gets a minus 2 so there is that and he's been refining it and changing some two pointer to a one pointer and etc etc and even i have been thinking about mine in terms of in terms of the balance between productivity and learning because mm-hmm. what i want to do is not just be productive but also spend some time learning something new whether it is merely reading something or you know sitting through an online course of some sort etc etc and and i find it's been motivated because i'm filling the excel sheet every day and uh, therefore in the middle of the day i'll ask myself okay how can i improve my score today though obviously at the end of this recording it would just straight away be a 10 but uh, it it just puts me in that work mode which is great and right now i think i've sorted the productivity but i need to sort the learning out so my question for you is given the different approaches that sudhir and i took to building our separate w- w- this thing can i ask you to think aloud with me on how you would construct a, a satisfaction index for you in terms of defining what a good day is the phenomenal questions yeah i'm thinking about the habits that i have through my day because i think they have been intentionally constructed i've put together my day in a particular way um 
highest on that list, I think, is reading, for sure. But it also matters reading what. And for the longest time, I was reading a lot of literature that I agreed with. And off late, I've been attempting to read a lot of literature that I disagree with because this whole, you know, finding the first principles uh, perspective. And I try to read every night. So that that would certainly be on my on my list. Luckily for me, because I grew up in a house where dad used to read a lot and I started reading very young. Have you been to Bookworm, by the way, the older Bookworm that used to be on? Uh, I've been MG to the Road. Bookworm on this road. So before that, the MG Road, the Bookworm used to be where the current metro station is. Dear and listener, we are at Church Street. And once I recorded with Ram Guha here four or five years ago. And uh, he said, where are you going after the recording? So I said, I'm going to the best bookstore in the world. And he said, what is that? And I said, Blossoms. And he said, you fool, that is not even the best bookstore on Church Street. <laughs> and he meant Bookworm. But I'm sorry, continue. Just yeah, to give perspective. I, I agree with, with him over here. I, I prefer uh, Bookworm to Blossoms. There used to be an old Bookworm store. And um, dad used to take me there once a week or once in two weeks. And they had a process where you could borrow a book and then return the same book to them. And they'd, they'd sort of give you a... So you borrow at 100 or you buy at 100 you give it back to them at 80 and so on and so forth. And uh, tons of reading came out of that one one bookworm store. It no longer exists, though, unfortunately. So re reading for sure, but that, that's been a habit for such a long time that I don't think it's possible that I don't do it. I don't think I can I can go to sleep if I don't read a book. Even if it's a single page, I have to, and then I find myself falling asleep. Um, so that's certainly part of the day. The second is fitness. So you know I dance, which means I'm either dancing or at the gym uh, one day or, I mean, in, 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 f through the day, but five to six days of every week. Right. The the gym bit is interesting. So you know Julian Shapiro, and he's written a piece called How to Build Muscle. When I was growing up, I was very skinny. So you've not seen photos of me as a, as a, as a younger uh, person, but uh, just skin and bones, right? Um, and when I came back to Bangalore about a year and a half, two years ago, I took the call that, all right, enough, enough is enough. It's time to put on some muscle. And his workout plan made a lot of sense to me. It's very well researched. You can link it in the show notes if anybody uh, wants to go down that road. But I have struggled keeping weight on my body. And so I, I follow that program. I do three days a week. And that helps a ton on, on putting on weight. I didn't think I'd fall in love with gymming, but I have. It's a very fun process. And I've suddenly started learning about all little muscles across my entire body. There's a stoic quote, which I can't remember exactly, which talks about um, how wasted a life is if you have not been able to to find all of those, those muscles and the, the strength that you are capable of. And over the last year and a half, two years, I've been discovering that. So three, day, three days a, a week gymming and two or three days a week I go dancing. Um, I've been dancing since I was 13, 14 years old. I still continue the habit and I'm trying to learn as many new forms as I can. So as long as it's dance of some form, I will learn it and I will enjoy it. Uh, I'm often the only guy in the room. Lots of women dance and not enough men dance, unfortunately. Good but way to meet people. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, really fun and, and I love the process it's it's one of those experiences where you, you, you simply stop thinking mathematically or rationally or reasonably and you are only in a state of moment movement it's 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 continuous flow and it's uh, it also requires some amount of logical thinking because you have to memorize the steps and you have to think about how you're going wrong you have to watch yourself in the mirror and figure out if the way the instructor is doing it is not similar to how you're doing it and why so some amount of left brain but, but broadly I think it's a it's a very expressive form. Um, so those are my two things that I do for health and fitness. And I don't think that I I can, it will, it will stay on my on my list that, that we're building here together. So that's reading and that's fitness. The third, I think, is um, speaking to somebody in, in within my inner circle. Right? It could be family, it could be friends, whoever it is. And especially because I've been attempting very consciously to make more friends, which means I have to maintain those relationships. Um, so I have since made two or three very good friends. I'm very grateful for their existence. And we have conversations like this, in fact, in, on many of our conversations, in, in many of our private talks. And so I attempted to connect with somebody at least once a day. I typically tend to go home. Uh, that's where my, my parents live, you know, a few times a week at the, at the worst, which means I spend some time with my family as well. And those things will feature on this list. Beyond that, I think there are lots of company-related things, which is... Have I done certain things that I, I certainly have to from a company perspective? But those are very technical. They go into metrics that I'm responsible for, how we've moved those metrics. I use Todoist. I know you, you, you're you big on productivity tools. Todoist has worked very well for me. And so I'm also sort of checking to see if I haven't slacked off on those responsibilities that, that I've set for myself, right, and so on and so forth. I can't think of, of, of very much else. Is Are there things on your list that I've missed that, that you think has to be on everybody's list? 
So my I need to make a proper detailed list like Sudhir's list, but Sudhir's list, if I remember correctly, and I hope he won't my mind my giving up uh, giving away some of it uh, includes what you just mentioned that one phone call every day to someone in the family or intimate friends and talk to them for X number of minutes. I forget right. that is another item on his list is meet a new person. You know, meet a new person and talk to them, hmm. which is uh, really interesting. I love the thought behind that. It scares the shit out of me because I'm. you know <laughs> not that kind of person but i i sort of like that and one of his fitness ones is eat no carbs so yeah so if, as you were speaking i think food and nutrition and sleep those are two things that i certainly have on the list so i don't know if you and i have ever spoken about this but i have been lucid dreaming all my life so i have intense lucid dreams since i I've, i was a child i have the memory of being able to lucid dream most nights i lucid dream and i also have a lot of sleep paralysis it, it, it just sort of exists and i tend to sleep a lot i tend to sleep 9 10 hours on average per night and so this part of my life i've had to take very seriously because it's not like i can resolve the fact that i lucid dream but i can i can control it really well which means lighting in the evening for example has to stay dim then my brain you know clicks into okay it's time to sleep more i have to sleep on time every day i tend to sleep at approximately the same time uh, then sleep the entire 9 10 hours which is what i usually have to sleep to be able to be well rested all of that so sleep for sure and nutrition can you elaborate on uh, you actually we've had a long conversation about both the sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming mm-hmm. and i found it incredibly fascinating but for the sake of the listeners like what is lucid dreaming of course so a lucid dream is a dream that you have control over somewhat which is you know that you are dreaming and you have some ability to orchestrate the happenings in that dream it's not always that you can control everything because your subconscious is still at play and it's it's always creating new and weird things in the dream um, sometimes in contrast to what your conscious wills uh, or wishes will happen but that's approximately what lucid dream is now m- most of us lucid dream you you must as well lots of people don't remember the lucid dreams when they wake up and they don't lucid dream every night it's infrequent sleep paralysis the, the what's happening behind the scenes on sleep paralysis is when you go to bed your your brain puts your body in a state of paralysis by choice because you are about to dream and when you dream you are likely to move like a dog you know running when it's when it's dreaming and to prevent you from moving too much or excessively uh, your body goes into a state of paralysis right Um, now what's supposed to happen is when you wake up you, uh, before you wake up or so a few minutes before you wake up your, sup- your your brain is supposed to exit your body from a state of paralysis and then you can go about your day not even knowing that you were paralyzed it happens to all of us when we sleep But if you experience sleep paralysis it is simply the experience where you wake up before your body has left a state of paralysis this happens very frequently middle of the night where your eyes open up so they're wide open but you can't really move the rest of your body and as a child it used to terrify me and of course understandably right because i'm awake but the rest of my body seems not to move and i wish i was stuck in a dream or even in a lucid dream but i'm not i know that i'm awake through history the experience of sleep paralysis has presented in very ex- interesting ways the most common is the illusion hallucination is probably the better word of an old woman sitting on your chest weighing you down uh, we can see this i think on on paintings in in um, certain old architecture where they, they draw an old hag on your chest and the reason that happens is because your brain attempts to fill the gap so you wake up your eyes are open but you can't move your body and part of not being able to move your body is that you can't breathe in very deeply right your rib cage is, is frozen in place but you're afraid it's the natural reaction you're scared that that you've woken up and you find yourself unable to move and as a consequence you try to breathe very deeply and when you do you find that your rib cage is preventing the expansion of your lungs now your brain has to attempt to answer this it has to say it has to in some way explain why this is happening to you and it does so through the illusion of an old woman sitting on your chest why old why woman i don't know i think this ties in some deep way to what we're afraid of and not afraid but of but you have your own old hag yes i i've experienced the old hag uh, mm. a few times at least and this is when i was younger mm. as i grew older so i in, in fact conducted a series of experiments around this i went on the internet as one does with problems like this and the the voodoo part of the internet recommended that or, or said that this is to do with astral projections so this is a literal example of for example when you have an out of body experience your soul leaves your body and something else could for example come into your body right these are the, the, the sorts of hypotheses that that abound on the internet and so i wanted to test this and the way i did that was um, and in one of my sleep paralysis slash out of body experiences i levitated out of my body turned around could see myself sleeping on the bed went to the bookshelf and moved a book 
I switched a book uh, from one place to another. Then I woke up and I checked if the book had moved and it had not. And then I concluded that, okay, this is not real. And this, I'm, I'm a child still at this stage, right? Um, and then... It, then is it a combination then of sleep paralysis and a lucid dream? No, no. The, the outer body experience is completely a lucid dream. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The sleep paralysis is separate where you wake up. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you, you also see shadowy figures. What happens is you wake up and you're sort of frozen in place, but your eyeballs can move. And you can look left, for example, to the edge of the room in a mm-hmm. corner, mm-hmm. but there's no, there's no light there and it's completely dark. And your brain has to has to come up with some way to explain it. And it creates a shadowy figure who darts between all the corners of the room. Simply because when you look to the corner, the, sh- the shadowy figure follows wow. to the other corners. So well. you've seen the shadowy of figure. Of course. Uh, and, but most people who have sleep paralysis experience all of these things. Mm. It's just your brain hallucinating to fill the gaps. And it's a brain that is still in some part of, of the dream world. So it's still sort of dreaming, but your eyes are awake and this is an I- inevitable consequence. And the minute I figured out that this is not real, it is simply in my mind. So it's real in the way that it's a mm. hallucination. They stopped happening. I had no no hags, no shadowy creatures. I, I just sort of opened my eyes and I realized that I was sleep paralyzed. And the easiest way to, to exit is to go back to sleep. And so I closed my eyes and go back to sleep. And a few minutes later, I'd be awake and it was all fine. Can you lucid dream at will? Yes. So, I mean, theoret- not theoretically. Through practice, it's possible. Lots of people who want to get into lucid dreaming do this. I know all this because of all the literature I've read around this. The, the way to do it is you have to lie on your back. It's easier to lucid dream when you're on your back than when you're on your stomach. Close your eyes and attempt to fall asleep. Now, as you fall asleep, keep kicking yourself awake. So every few minutes, you sort of have to remember, hey, I am falling asleep. And then attempt to wake up. Don't open your eyes, but within your mind, attempt to wake up. If you do this for long enough uh, and you practice you know, for some amount of time, you should be able to wake up inside a dream where you wake up, but you are asleep. And lucid dreams are wonderful. But once I figured out that it's, it is only my brain and a hallucination and does not have any real world consequences, then... Um, I've done all sorts of interesting and wonderful things in lucid dreams. For example, you get to create characters who will never leave. They will always stay there. Um, it's, it's as if you cross a curtain when you sleep and you wake up in another world where a story can continue night after night. You can, you can build wow, a re- so you can build a recurring story with the same characters. 100%. And there are, there are spaces that, I've, that, I, that my brain has created. It's not conscious, of course. Uh, so for example, there is a, a very tall mountain where it's always raining. It never ceases to rain. And it's quite an arduous journey up the mountain. I think I've only made it up in my memory two or three times in total. And right on top, there is a hut. Uh, and by the time I reach there, I'm soaked and drenched. Um, and the hut is very warm. There's candles inside and it's a warm space. And in the hut is a very old man. And I can present to him a question that I've been contending with, struggling with for a long time. And usually I get very meaningful answers. Like? It could it could be something as as... I can give you an example... Last year, we were, we were, okay, there, there was an employee on team who we were finding to be quite problematic. And we weren't sure whether we have to let this person go or not. And I was really struggling with it because this person was performing incredibly well, but was not, was not aligning with lots of the the value culture side of of the business that we were building and we'd spent a lot of time talking about internally we would take a dent as a business if we were to let this person go and i couldn't really arrive at an answer by myself it was plaguing me and troubling me and on a subconscious level and this is one of the questions that we had a long conversation about me and myself i guess the future version of myself the old Mm -hmm. man whatever whatever the archetype here is Um, and it was very valuable for me because I realized that, that the answer, of course, was to let the person go. Uh, and to arrive at that answer, I, I think, meant that I had to let go of, you know, okay, I can't report the best numbers next month, right? Or I will actually have to struggle on this. I'll have to work 20% more to fill up the gaps. Hiring will be a pain in the ass, of course. But the answer was let the person go. And to be able to have that conversation with myself in an honest way, on top of a mountain <laughs> where it's raining outside and candles inside, is a very fun experience. And I can imagine when you let the person go, he asks you, but why are you sacking me? And you say, because I, I had a dream last night and an old man on top of a mountain where it was raining in a warm hut with candles told me to let you go. So you can also have sex in your lucid dream if you want to, with anyone you want. Hypothetically, mm-hmm. a person who's lucid dreaming could have sex in their lucid dream, yes. Hypothetically, you never have. Yeah, I know, but uh, I, I did not presume that your podcast delves into these these tabloid subjects. I uh, uh, So I had an episode with Devangshu Dutta and most people would have missed it because the first one hour was uh, 
talk about really boring subjects mm-hmm. but after that we spoke for an hour and a half about sex and porn and all of that and it was quite wild so people should certainly check it out so you can essentially every like tonight when you go back you can enter a lucid dream and you can do no, whatever but i you don't want. do it at will i've never enter a lucid dream at will it just uh, happens mm. i mean whatever fortunately unfortunately that is just and you have this record yeah. places and correct recurring characters not always but quite frequently there are recurring places there's a cityscape uh, there is like a like a oh my school yeah uh one of the places is and it's actually an amalgamation of the various places i studied mm-hmm. which is one sort of mixed scape right where i get to meet people from my childhood my classmates people i haven't spoken to in forever they still present as young versions of themselves in you know my last memory of who that person was they sound the same which is so weird to me because if i had to at will come up with how somebody sounded like their voice mm. i wouldn't be able to if i close my eyes and try to remember how a classmate of mine sounded for example in a lucid dream you can yes and i'm sure there's some box somewhere in my brain where that that data point is stored on how somebody sounds and it's sort of yanked out from there when i have to have a conversation with this person uh, do you have a sleep tracker uh, no i don't like i i wear a sleep tracker for example which tells me the quality of my sleep every night and when the rem comes and rem is mm. when the dreams yes. happen right and the rem always is bunched towards the end yes. which is why i keep telling people that if 8 hours is your natural sleep then sleeping for 7 doesn't mean you've done most of it you've actually probably blocked out half the rem and and so yeah so what are the theories behind lucid dreaming like is it good for you is it bad for you can it be problematic no i don't i mean i think all it does is is ruin qu- quality of sleep mm. so you have to sleep a lot more because you're just a lot more tired when you wake up i feel like my brain is done work even when i'm sleeping Ouch. where it's doing all this talking and thinking and conversing and all of that but sleeping more fixes it and that's that's been good enough for me the theory behind lucid dreaming i think broadly links to the theory behind dreaming itself which is it is in preparation for some horrible things that could happen in the real world the so if you if you dream for example the death of a loved one then the hypothesis this this as far as i know again i'm not a, a this is not a subject matter that i have any expertise in it's all it's all you know basic reading when it eventually happens that somebody does die the same person does die you've already gone through the experience once or twice or a dozen times and you are just better equipped to deal with that experience so that's sort of the if i'm if i'm not wrong one of the reasons why it seems like we dream which is that dreams allow you to create these circumstances that could happen in the real world you contend with those circumstances and then when it happens in the real world if it does then you're ready for them or better prepared for them that seems very post facto and a little stretched out and most of my dreams have nothing to do with preparing me for anything <laughs> so i uh, sort of Correct. wonder where that's from but let's quickly go back to your satisfaction index mm-hmm. i think i took a digression away from that so there's reading there's physical working out there's nutrition there is sleep and there is the office stuff and, and talking to loved ones and talking to loved ones yes yeah. and then yeah so wow all right so you know we've i've taken a lot of your time today and i'm already feeling guilty and i need to let you go back to your company because we all need tilt but uh, sort of a final question to kind of end this with for me and my listeners give recommendations of books films music that have meant a lot to you and that you'd like to share with everyone yes before that mm. At Or the end of this podcast. If you want podcast, to ask me something, you're welcome to. Oh, uh, of course. Don't, no, but at the end of this podcast, and this is for your for your gentle readers, we will be going outside and then teaching you how to ride a bicycle. Yeah, I don't know how to ride a bicycle. Yes, gentle. Amit does not know how to ride a bicycle. I think it is incorrigible, given that we are friends. I have taken it upon myself to teach you how to ride a bike. It is not difficult, and you can expect on Amit's Twitter. a photo or a video of him riding a bicycle incredibly unlikely partly because while my cold has been con- my sneezing has been my allergy or whatever it was has been controlled with antihistamines i'm now getting a bit of a bad headache and all of that so you can see that i'm ready but i will sportingly uh, you know now that you've got the cycle i will uh, wonderful sort of come with you and okay so now on books You have not read The Brothers Karamazov. I remember when we spoke the last it, time. Oh, you have? As okay. a child, Dostoevsky was the first serious author I was into. Did mm. I tell you my origin story of literature? No. In the sense, the origin story of my introduction to literature. My dad had thousands of books lying around, and such serendipity, I think, is invaluable for a kid. I was deeply lucky in that way, and uh, I used to read the normal thing that kids read. And then one day I came across this book called, and I think it was an Everyman's Library edition of the House of the Dead, and it sounded like funky. It sounded like fun, and I read it, and it was of course an account of Dostoevsky's years in um, uh, Siberia. And uh, yeah, and and I was ten years old, and from there I think that year I read all of Dostoevsky, all of Shakespeare, a whole bunch of other stuff, much of which I was obviously too young to absorb properly. Like my favorite Shakespeare. play in those days was Titus Andronicus possibly because it had the most violence and uh, and today that seems bizarre to me uh, you know why would i think like that but 
yeah but it it, it was uh, i was very fortunate to sort of have that introduction wonderful that is a, that is a good question for people who do read vociferously what is your what is your origin story on reading mine involves reading in the bathroom mm. uh, and yours yeah okay uh, now okay on this question i've actually compiled a list because i know this is your last question always yeah. to to all your folks oh my god you're um, preparing pardon you're prepared <laughs> i didn't expect this yeah th- so the company that we build is incorporated feynman technology private limited mm-hmm. after richard feynman mm-hmm. who because of my love for physics i absolutely adore mm-hmm. everything feynman has written is worth reading especially in particular a collection of letters that were compiled after his death which i'm sure you've read mm-hmm. perfectly reasonable deviations from the beaten track it's a wonderful book some of the letters in particular in that book are are really fun to read um, and give you a deep insight into one feynman himself but Uh, how philosophy is probably not limited he's a physicist and by and okay in a lot of ways we would consider him a philosopher but he thought so deeply about various subjects across the width and breadth of of his times and i thought it was a very wonderful read on my list i've actually written the ones who walk away from omelas wow so it's amazing that it it's came amazing up. that it came up but you certainly should should read it i love everything magical realism so i started off with 100 years solitude with salman rushdie but if you if you think that that magical realism is your kind of reading i would strongly recommend quixote by salman rushdie it's very beautifully written i liked it more than midnight children um if you like george orwell you must have read v w e i don't actually recall reading v yeah so it's it's by a russian author mm. and it was it was published before orwell wrote 1984 mm. and there is uh, the theory that orwell stole 1984 mm. from this russian author and from this this book i don't know if true or not mm. uh, but i thought it was better than 1984 mm. so you certainly should in fact we can walk down to to bookworm after this mm. and get you a copy if we you... will not walk down my friend we will cycle down we will cycle just down. Uh, yes. express so much enthusiasm i only have one bicycle so you can cycle and run after you. it's it's interesting that for the longest time till well into my adulthood i was ashamed of telling people i didn't know how to cycle <laughs> and now I don't give a shit like yeah I don't know so what can you do it our podcast <laughs> yeah wonderful no but but we'll fix that mm-hmm. okay when i was growing up i read a lot of pg woodhouse i recommend it very strongly he's hilarious again this is came from my dad because he used to read a lot of uh, mm-hmm. woodhouse yeah that's 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 sort of my immediate recommendations uh, have you read the egg by andy weir no can i tell you the story quickly it's very tell short tell me the story quickly uh, and you were going to read out a poem by which one someone you wanted to introduce me to oh tim minchin tim something. it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. too blasphemous and i feel like i know i know you're already saying that if people come this far in your podcast then they've come far enough and yeah. they they wouldn't mind the blasphemy give me a, the give me the blasphemy but i think we we leave this to the next podcast Are where sure? i'm i'm very sure oh but i'll send God. it so th- it's it's a it's a poem it's a beat poem called storm mm. by tim minchin mm. i listened to it when i was uh, 16 17 mm. i found it on some random uh, 4chan thread mm. and then from there um, they sort of ended up listening to everything he's ever written mm. um, all of these are very interesting first positions these mm. are people who vehemently believe in something that is contrarian mm. and then are, are so articulate in their ability to express that viewpoint in a way that that convinces you into at least some of the things that they believe in mm. okay the egg by andy weir mm. is a story about a man who dies in a car crash mm. he wakes up and he finds himself in heaven mm. in front of him is god white robed bearded as 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 god would be and he says uh, what just happened and god says well you died and he says that's horrible you know how how did i die and he says well car crash if you remember you were driving then you got hit and you died and the man says all right well i can come to terms with that now that i'm dead what is this is this heaven and god thinks for a bit and says yeah well perhaps perhaps it is heaven and he says okay great now um, what about my wife what about my kids what about my family and so god says you know we Uh, they're fine. I mean, it, 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 they're heartbroken, of course, the fact that you died. But they, they take a few years and they all get over it. Your kids gr- grow up to become, you know, meaningful citizens. Uh, they all are fine. The fact that you died uh, is, of course, sorrowful to them, but does not impact them further than that. And he wipes the sweat off his brow and he says, "My gosh, thank you. That's that's so wonderful to hear that my family is going to be fine despite the fact that I died." Then, after a bit of thinking, he says, "All right, what happens now?" And uh, God looks him square in the eye and says. Well, you're going back, and the man leaps and he says, "Well, the Hindus were right. You're reincarnating me. I go back." And again, God is 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 quite is quite puzzled by the question, and he says, "Well, you know, in a way, all of all of them were right." And he says, "All right, wonderful. So, where do I go back to?" 
and he says you're going to be a tribal woman in 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 the early 15th century or something i don't know what the exact detail in the book is and uh, he says oh so i'm going back in time and again god is quizzed by the question and says yeah well i guess compared to where you were right now you're going back in time and now the man comes to uh, an odd realization he says well then i would have met myself at some point because if i can go back in time and forward in time then i certainly would have met myself and god says yeah it happens all the time and the man says what do you mean all the time and god says well they're all you jesus was you and hitler was you and all the jews he tortured w- was you every auto driver every person you interact with every family member the people you fell in love with got married to uh, every friend you had all of them were you and he says okay why why is all of this happening um, and the end of the book is is quite nice where he says well this is an egg and that's why the story is called the egg and he says that this is some rite of passage that you are still me right i know you call me god but you and i are not not that dissimilar the only thing separating us is the fact that you have to go through this and of course it's a made up story but i think of it, about it very frequently because if if i end up treating everybody i meet as potentially me in another life and i know that invariably the the suffering i cause will be my suffering the happiness i cause will be my happiness um, it orients me well in the world to whatever degree good and bad and well and poor mean anything at all so i recommend reading the book it i i, I read it as a child i was probably 16 17 but it stuck with me the entire way it's a fantastic parable and i'll turn it into a thought experiment and ask you a question mm-hmm. right? supposing you die like mm-hmm. you you have you have a big meeting for tilt and things are going really well and you have some important meeting where important things will happen and everybody is looking forward to that and you take a loo break before that and you collapse and you die and you wake up and you've got a man in white with a beard there mm-hmm. and he's saying that look you're in heaven heaven is incredible but i offer you the choice that you can go back if you want now but then when you die again you'll go straight to hell so what are you going to do it depends what is in heaven is is it just a, a vast wide at this moment you don't know Oh, he, I have I have no knowledge. You have no knowledge. He's, Then I, I have no no evidence that hell is bad either. You don't have any evidence hell is bad. Yeah, fair enough. Then I, then I think I, I mean, given that I know nothing about hell and nothing about heaven, but certainly everything about earth, mm. um, I'm happy to 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 toss that coin. And you'll come back. Yeah, but yeah, I, I, under the assumption that hell and heaven in this in this uh, hypothesis are equally great or equally bad. What would there have to be in heaven? Mhm. for you to want to stay there and not come back yeah that's i mean if it's similar enough to to earth then it is probably an, an equal sort of experience i'm more concerned about hell which is mm. if it if if it is the the abrahamic interpretation of endless torture and burning and suffering uh, that's horrible enough for me to say you know what i'm i'm going to hang around here i, I don't want to burn for eternity whatever that means uh, but but g- g- given the, the lack of definition within this this example uh, explicitly this example i probably probably do one more trip to earth so again i'll refer to the bezos interview of with arman lex friedman for the third time and he was asked about how it felt looking down on earth when he went to space and he quoted the astronaut jim lovell as saying the first time he saw earth from outside as saying that uh, you know at that moment i realized that you don't go to heaven when you die you go to heaven when you're born and i'm just thinking that any heaven would actually be hell because i can't in my mind imagine a heaven which is i mean it is a doing and the striving that makes life worth living right if you are in a steady state where you're in a super comfortable room with air condition and beautiful music and angels and endless seafood platters after that first moment of after it normalizes it is kind of hell isn't it i'm just thinking aloud yes and to tie it all back to the conversation we had so far i think the reason is because there is the absence of a journey there's the absence of a journey exactly that's what makes it hell and 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 another thing when you were telling me the ex story reminded me of this tweet i saw the other day if i find it i'll link it from the show notes but i may not find it about how this person was saying that you know if you think you're so important think about life a 100 years from now somebody else will be living in your house you know if any of your things are there i mean none of your things are there they'll have no significance to anyone they'll all have been thrown away they'll be decaying or they'll be biodegradable waste everything you ever built is gone and everything is kind of finished and that is so true that you know you don't even have to look at the cosmic scale of things after the universe yes. is gone you can just go a little bit back or a little bit forward and you realize that it's you know everything it's, is it's outrageously comforting 
I've always found great comfort in in the fact of our insignificance, or at least the the, the seeming fact of our insignificance. It it means you can try so many different things. It means that the landscape is open and and not rigidly shut with clear rules about what you ought to do and ought not to do. Uh, that you can ask questions and discover answers and and paint your way through life. Right, all of it is a canvas and it's yours to paint. Um, if you or, or to whatever degree that that your that your 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 will is predetermined and allows you to paint it in in, in such a way. Yes, the. Um, very when i was very young i remember we were there was a like an english class in school and we were asked to speak about any subject and i spoke about death and i sort of had everybody take a beat and think about how they would die how do you think you're going to die and when do you think you're going to die and again this is a, a very st- sort of st- stoic principle that i've seen that you know emulated with them where you also think through how everybody you love will die everybody in your life the, the people you care deeply about the people you, you hate for example like the, the, there's you know the, the people who say horrible things to you um, and they will eventually die as well all of us will um, and at best you will be remembered as a caricature of yourself when you think about some great historic personality you can say like a martin luther king right the, the image that forms in your head of a martin luther king is quite is is a caricature it's 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 five days of his life compressed into a single story or a henry ford who we spoke about yeah. um, i mean I, i remember reading about henry ford and i was so i was so shocked by how complex his life was and how all of us just remember him as guy who made the car right and in a thousand years not even henry ford right he, he will become a caricature of the caricature and so on and so forth uh, it is all insignificant in the end and that is so ultimately comforting it means that i have so much autonomy to do the things that i want to do with no due concern for being remembered being famous which is why when we started off this podcast i was saying i'm feeling quite nervous it's my first time speaking publicly to a larger group a very large group given your following and then when we went for a break i was telling you that i was quite puzzled by my nervousness because i have forever taken solace in this insignificance that if somebody listens to this and says deepak is an idiot so what they will die and so will i um, and the thought will die with them everybody's interpretation of you is just signals in their brain it's it's that that simple and that meaningless and that that should be comforting so uh, yeah I, i agree deeply with with what you what you said i remember when john nash and his wife died in a car accident a couple of years ago and i remember thinking what a waste that none of it matters the nobel prize doesn't matter the work doesn't matter the schizophrenia doesn't matter none of it matters everything comes down to that last horrifying instance mm. when he realizes he's having an accident and whatever he goes through in that last moment that is the whole life there is nothing else you know it all boils down to that you can live the best kind of life but you're going to go in pain like david sinclair in his book lifespan has a great passage about this and i think there's a fundamental truth there that even if you die in your sleep it's a you you don't know the kind of pain you're going through where your organs are failing one by one and you know it, 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 it's horrible i mean you escape that if you're like in a plane crash and it's an instant or you're in a craft which implodes way under the sea though even there you might have an inclination just before it does you might have an uh, sort of in uh, a sense just before it does that is going to happen and and so have you followed out this exercise have you thought about your own death yes certainly when I, especially when i was younger i did the exercise because i read deeply into it and then realized that it's a good way to to ground yourself you you have to lay a center of gravity once you have center of gravity it becomes very easy to do everything else because you're not easily swayed and part of that is coming to terms with with mortality the 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 interesting The interesting bit about this is I don't agree with you on two fronts. The first, I don't think I'm horrified or will be horrified at the time of my death. Now, I, there are some things I cannot help. If someone cuts me off at a, at a junction, I feel anger bubbling from deep inside me. I can't help it. It's subconscious. It comes from somewhere else. But what I do with the anger that I feel, that is in my control. And similarly, I'm sure that that if I were heading towards another car or truck or the plane was crashing, I would feel fear certainly because I cannot help it. It is it is instinctive and and subconscious. But what I do with that fear and whether I acknowledge it, whether I I shoo it away, a, a very nice quote I I read recently was uh, when you feel nervous and your butterflies in your stomach, you say get your butterflies in formation. <laughs> Mm-hmm. which is you cannot help but have butterflies so we don't want to pretend like that does not happen uh, but it is how quickly can you get them in formation and, and course correct i don't think that that um, i i will let the fear terrify me i think i i'm i'm quite happy to to face death when it comes and i'm saying this on 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 theory uh, but like i said earlier i don't know what i do in the actual situation i said i'd like to believe that this is how i would act and then you'd said something else which which i seem to have forgotten but on the original point this the solace that comes from the fact that you're going to die is what frees up your ability to 
to live in to live in a, in a careless a carefree way today uh, so it's a good thing I, i don't know what we what i do if if there was a way to be, become immortal i don't know if i'd pick it i haven't thought too deeply about it i'd love to hear your answer would you pick it but what that does to us as um, uh, or what does that does to my philosophy on this which is is it still equally insignificant and and if it is well well um, and if it is what do you do with an infinite life span it's i mean interesting thought experiment but i haven't really gone on that i'll i'll answer that question yeah. since you asked but before that you know your musings on death uh, reminded me of uh, like i think in, the, in in regard to how we are with death then this is not a difference of opinion but i guess a different of personality that i'll be more like john von neumann and you'll be more like enrico fermi mm-hmm. do you have any idea what i'm talking about no okay so subramaniam chandrashekhar once spoke about how von neumann and fermi died and both of them knew they were going to die before yes. they actually did and these are his words uh, this is in an interview this was posted by uh, this wonderful tweeter i don't know if i can call him a friend because i've never met him ashutol joglekar on twitter and um, so he posted this beautiful page from some book where chandrashekhar is uh, saying that the two cases are marked by contrast von neumann i think is pronounced neumann right yes. von neumann could not accept the fact that his death was inevitable he turned to catholic religion got himself baptized was in constant panic and was very demanding of clara fermi was very different the day after the operation when it became clear he would die herbert anderson and i went to see fermi in the hospital let me read to you what i have written so now this is subramaniam chandrashekhar quoting subramaniam chandrashekhar where he says it was of course very difficult to know what to say or how to open a conversation when all of us knew what the surgery had shown fermi resolved the gloom by turning to me and saying and these are fermi's words for a man past 50 nothing essentially new can happen and the loss is not as great as one might think now you tell me will i be an elephant next time <laughs> so good and i absolutely love this i wish to you know get to the stage where i can have fermi spirit but you know i wonder you know maybe you'll be the one neumann and i'll be the fermi uh, exactly there is no way to know until it actually happens there's no way to know uh, and the thought of like i would embrace immortality simply because of my bengali instinct for procrastination <laughs> it means that i have to deal with the inevitability of mortality a little later than i would like to so just for that reason i'm not sure life would be particularly pleasurable and if health span doesn't follow life span in the case of immortality mm-hmm. it could essentially be an immortality of dementia which is even worse what would i do with a, a life when i'm not even sort of aware of myself we didn't speak about many things including our shared atheism another matter on which we don't disagree but rather than go there i'll you know earlier when you were chatting something reminded me of a question somebody asked me about something that ajay said in an episode of everything is everything where he was uh, talking about how he once had to teach something and he realized that so many people wanted him to teach it that he he said this became my dharma Mm. that i would uh, you know teach mm. this and somebody pointed that out to me and i jokingly told them that ajay and i are both atheists with a sense of dharma you know and they asked me to do an episode on that i don't think ajay will do that any time but i am struck by that sense of dharma that certainly in the context of the limited things that i do I, i i do feel that there is a purpose i do feel it's important grandiose as it might sound immodest as it might sound that I, i i do feel that there is a larger purpose i feel when it comes to doing something like this podcast for example and i i think dharma is also something that one can think of in the context of professions like my friend suyash rai and i have had many discussions on this that how do you get that sense of dharma where most people will not feel it but if you are that kind of person then if you're a journalist you will feel there is a certain duty involved in that and you have to follow it out if you're a doctor of course quite obviously and in a cliched way and so on and so forth so do you think of your having some kind of dharma in the work that you do in the life that you live before i answer that i think you've missed the most important upside of being able to be immortal potentially which is your podcast don't have to stop at eight hours you could do <laughs> 24 day long podcasts totally insane oh my god anyway on on that question i think broadly i mean of course the answer is yes right but uh, we were talking about this earlier i think different kinds of entrepreneurs some people genuinely want to solve some very large and difficult problem angad is the perfect example because he wants to clean the air and that's so noble 
and he's found a, a way to do it that generates profit and can be scaled and so on and so forth and some people go out look looking for a problem to solve which i feel is more like the entrepreneurs that we were which is we we started off and said hey i want to do something with my life that is not getting a job we know that i, I suddenly discovered that there was this instrument of of you know being able to form a private limited company and you know equity and all of those things to be able to accomplish these goals and then we can we can run on and try and build it maybe and at the heart of both of these types of entrepreneurs although they seem distinct at the face of it is still the selfish motive which is when i go to bed at night i want to feel great about how i've conducted my day and if i feel that way every night for months and years then it's a good way to have lived my life uh, so i'm i'm still sort of solving my daily problem i'll be it in different ways so embedded in that is is some sort of a dharma so i i can see that that point of view but yeah i mean p- p- perhaps my philosophy does not extend to such a degree that i can give a more nuanced answer on this yeah so i mean have a great time talking to you today i mean the next time you lucid dream not the next time mm-hmm. but maybe one day when you have that lucid dream <laughs> and you're on that mountain and it's raining and uh-huh. you climb and you climb and you climb and finally just when you're about to give up you see the hut and you go near the hut and you can see the candles from a distance and you enter the hut and it is warm and there is that old man and then you sit down and then after a while you get up to go because you realize that you have to get back to the real world and the old man says no stay here so i don't know why i said that but it's an interesting parable but maybe such a day will come but Perhaps. is that is that a morbid note to end on no no it's, it's absolutely possible the 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 only caveat is that eventually i will wake up the only caveat is that eventually you wake up i hope you do so deepak thanks uh, this has been a blast and uh, you have to come here again because you have you promised to read out a particular poem next time mm. so we sh- i shall we should do I lots of poetry actually maybe next time we should do our next recording on uh, cycles side by side <laughs> thank you amit if you enjoyed listening to this episode share it with whoever you feel might like it especially entrepreneurs check out the show notes enter rabbit holes at will you can follow deepak on twitter at deepak vs you can follow me on twitter at amit varma a m i t v a r m a you can browse past episodes of the seen and the unseen at seenunseen.in or any podcast app of your choice thank you for listening Did you enjoy this episode of the Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in/support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.